Broadcasting live from the Loading Ready Run orbiting underground moon base, it's the Lurcast. Special 20th anniversary edition, episode four. Ooh. Ooh. With the subtitle that uh, James has suggested anyway of, you can get paid for this. Or is that, Question you can get mark? paid for this? You can get paid for this? You can, you, you can get paid for this? Yeah. I don't know exactly where he put his emphasis. But uh, yeah, this was, this is a big couple of years for us here. This is sort of broadly speaking, 2008, 2009. Right. Uh, and. Yeah, and th this yeah. was, this was actually the, so yeah, I guess, I, I don't know. Does the, the notes have the chron chronology for when things happened? Yeah, so the sort of the the big sort of inflection point that James is referring to here when he writes down that you can get paid for this is uh, November 2008 mm. was the Escapist Film Festival. Right. And they had uh, they had zero punctuation. They, you know, they, they found their golden goose very early. Uh, and still going. at time of recording, they are still <laughs> uh, trucking along. And, you know, I still watch it. It's still good. As it turns out, Yahtzee really knows what he's doing. Um, and they were like, hey, we want to be uh, at, at the time under under uh, Russ. They, they decided that they wanted to really... Uh, become like a you know a as as well as all of their long form written content, which was at the time very good because they originally were like a magazine, not like a printed magazine, but like a internet magazine. It's a little hard to explain. Uh, they wanted to also do video stuff. They wanted to be like a you know like a destination for excellent internet video, right? And they wanted to uh, pay appropriately, which was right. which was a refreshing change of pace, and. We, because we, you know, we talked about River and stuff in a previous episode, and so yeah, they did a film festival, and it was basically like send in your submissions, and then we'll, you know, we'll there'll be like there'll be public voting, and also internally we'll figure stuff out, and we'll do, we'll uh, we'll, you know, we'll pick something to 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 do a new series on the Escapist, and so we thought, oh heck, we should do that. The rippling surface of flowing water transforms the soft light of the morning sun. Hi, Beans folks. I'm the narrator. I just took a fistful of Valium. Oh, yeah. And Unskippable was... It was sort of an idea that we had had kicking around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're both big fans of Mystery Science Theater and Rift Tracks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The idea, of obviously, of, of making fun of um, a video game or something, you know, it's very much the, like... Uh, just like hanging out with your friend mm. while like they're playing the game and you're sitting there yeah, uh, with them. I mean, in the same way that Mr. Science Theater is sort of like, you know, watching a movie with your friends joking about it if your friends were funnier than your actual friends. Uh, and so so we had this idea. So so the idea with, with Unskippable being just the sort of opening cutscene, that was the initial premise. Um, yeah. We you know, fudged it a little as, as stuff went on, you know, skipped little bits of gameplay and stuff. But yeah. Well, because, was, and I don't, I don't think this was our fault, but it's very funny to consider that it might be our fault, but it, I don't, I don't actually think so. But as the show went on, games less and less often had the like seven minute unskippable cinematic before gameplay. Yeah. Right. They were, games were very much like, no, 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 we got to get the player like into this. And so you'd have like, a one one and a half minute thing and then the gameplay section and then more of a story dump and so you know as as the show went on years later we would be like you know we do a little bit and then be like several minutes of boring gameplay later or one yeah. one tutorial later yeah yeah the thing that, would, that always bugged me was when they would do that but like the gameplay was literally just like you walking to the next cut like there was no actual like gameplay it was yeah. just like we're making you do this walking to the next cutscene rather than just 
showing you it. I mean, we said to this, give this idea of gameplay. We said this at the time, but like Half Life casts a long shadow over video game openings, right? The whole like getting on the cable car, whatever it is, the train, the yeah, tram yeah. at Black Mesa, and going all the way through it and everything. And it's like it's playable, but it's not not really and so there was a lot of games like that i think the most infamous one for me anyway was alone in the dark that had you manually blink (laughs) to clear your eyes because you were really groggy (laughs) we uh made the um pilot unskippable for lost planet yeah and now lost planet i don't see the issue i mean they're clearly on the planet in question it's not lost we i mean we've talked about in the past that that we were actually like kind of medium on even submitting it. Yeah, this is something that, I mean, I felt really good about this when I heard this eventually later, but an interview with Mike Nelson, one of the hosts and for many, many years, head writer of Mystery Science Theater, who then went on to found Riff Tracks and has done that for, I think, I think he's been doing Riff Tracks longer than he did Mystery Science Theater at this point and talking about the, you know, the writing process, uh, which is, what we discovered, but we didn't know that this was like a solved problem uh, that the people from Mystery Science Theater had already encountered and dealt with, which is that when you're doing content like that, like we had done it with sketches, right? Yeah. Where it's like we do the sketch and like we write it and it's funny and we film it and it's funny and then we edit it. And by the time we put it live, we're like, I don't really know if this is funny. And then we put it live and people are like, oh, it is. But with this kind of thing, because you like watch it and throw ideas down and then you get more ideas down and then you record them and then you re-record and then you do another pass. It's a very iterative process. Yeah. We've seen the jokes or heard the jokes so many times that by the time we're done an episode, they are not funny. Yeah. And the whole episode is not funny. And it was this interview with Mike where he was talking about exactly that thing for Mystery Science Theater. And he said, you just have to have faith in yourself. Yeah. You you have to believe that what like, you thought was funny yeah. once. If you believe you're funny, you have to trust that what you thought was funny when you wrote it the first time is still funny now. You just don't think it's very good anymore. Yeah. Uh and yeah, that that was that was exactly what happened. As Paul said, we've told the story before, but you know, I'll I'll say it again. We were like, we finished it. We finished the episode. This is the thing. It was done. And we mm. were like, no, this is not you know it i guess in our head at the time it was like better just to not put anything in than to put something in that we think is bad mm. right we don't want to put our name on something that we don't actually believe in so let's just not do it and i was talking to kathleen that night literally the night before the deadline and i was like yeah no we did it and it's done but you know we're just not feeling it and uh, and she was like what well, just send it in it's done. Yeah. What's the worst that happens? They say no. And I was like, no, okay. They say no and they blacklist us. Yeah. We're cursed from from ever making comedy on the internet again. So, yeah, I was like, all right, fine. So I sent in it and I did the form and shipped it off and then went, went to work uh, the next day. At the time, I was working at ICBC, the mm-hmm. Insurance Corporation of British Columbia. My department was essentially like, it's like, like the DMV if it was a sort of owned by the government. I don't know if the DMV is owned by the government. I don't know where you live. Uh, anyway, I was working in ticket payment processing, which and- was a dire job. And I mentioned this because uh, I go to work that morning and then at around like 1130, like noonish or whatever, I get, I, I get a phone call <laughs> from a number I don't recognize. And I was like, what's this? So I duck into the copy room and answer it. And it's Russ from the escapist and he's basically saying like this is great Mm. uh whatever happens with how the contest shakes out like because i he didn't have complete control over like how the how the winners would be selected or whatever right because there was a lot of audience voting involved and so he's he basically was like even if you don't win the contest we still want to make this show and and i think we at that point, he like we also learned that like he actually was familiar with Loading Ready Run, yeah, from like other stuff, yeah, and was hoping that we had, would submit something. Yeah, I mean there wasn't a lot in the way of like medium profile video game sketch comedy at the time, so uh, so yeah, it, that that was a that was that was great. And to, I, I to think hear. We, I think we ended up coming in like second. 
in the actual like i think officially it was a tie was it yeah no yeah. there was there was two winners it was us unskippable and doomsday arcade he went on to do a whole bunch of stuff in australia yeah uh did a whole um like a limited series called uh, The Wizard of Oz. Why can't you just leave me alone? Oh, well, I heard you moved to the human realm and I thought, sounds like a bit of fun. It's very funny and good and ridiculous and still does all of his own special effects and it's preposterous. It's very, very good stuff. But anyway. So, yeah, so this was, you know, we we did, uh, we got this for uh, a thing for Unskippable and we got this sort of contract for it i think it was for maybe a year or two yeah i think it was a year to start uh, with you know weekly so 52 episodes yeah or whatever at that point we needed there needed to be an entity for the escapist to sign a contract with yeah <laughs> uh and so that's when we we created uh bionic trousers media as a uh it was just a partnership between graham and i legally but, in Canada, but as, it's called a limited partnership yeah you know it wasn't uh ltd or like it wasn't not a corporation uh, a corporation or anything yeah in fact it was very bad because the way that a limited partnership works is that yeah, they consider any income of the partnership is just 50 50 personal income of the yeah, the, I mean, the partners involved, but it just it, it just means that you get taxed at personal income levels, which is nowhere near as uh, uh, nice, I guess, as corporate tax rate, which is a lot lower. Yeah, I think the the uh, the form you have to come with and you have to put in a name for your company as well as several uh, other options because um, they, they, they want to make sure that the name is available like you can't have the same name as another company. So Graham's mom. Mm -hmm. had bionictrousers.com yep. as a website. Because my mom, as a hobby, she's retired, but like as a hobby, she does like domain auctions. Yeah. She'll like get one cheap and be like, that'd be a good brand name for something and then like sell it for more. And uh, it's like, it's, it's, I was like, are awesome. Good job. This is so, great. Yeah. So she had bionictrousers.com. Yeah. Which put her in the mind of Wallace and Gromit. Yeah. You know, like the wrong trousers kind of thing. And she was like, I have this, I have this URL and if you ever want it for something. For better or for worse at the time, we, we liked the idea of, you know, Loading Ready Run was the name of the sketch comedy. Mm -hmm. But and then having the sort of entity that creates the sketch comedy and other things not necessarily be loading ready run so yeah banner trousers media or was the name because it, it had to you have to have a name and then like what you do yeah it has to be at least in the province where we are part of the requirement is there has to be like some sort of descriptive word in there yeah like like if it's you have a plumbing company it's like you, whatever plumbing yeah you can't just be like pipes and wrenches you can put that on your truck but like it legally has to be like pipes and wrenches plumbing corp yeah. or whatever you know it has to be part of that uh thing so, so yeah we're so like it, media so yeah it was bionic trousers media and bionic then like trousers fart jokes our other options were like and then we, we we did put down like loading ready run media yeah and stuff as like second option but weirdly bionic trousers wasn't taken no. in bc uh so we were able to uh get that name and uh especially when we're doing uh something uh you know, sort of in a serious business environment, like <laughs> at a bank or, uh, or, you know, at the lawyers or anything like that. It never sees like the first time people see, they always look at, you know, they'll look at the business card or look at whatever, and they'll be like a little, <laughs> yeah, a little, a little it's great. Chuckle, it's a good, always nice. it's a, it's a great name. The funniest interaction for it still is when we moved into uh Moonbase Delta, which we'll talk about later, but it was in the, in the same building as the, ms society multiple sclerosis society and they they had like this wing of their building that they just weren't using and wanted to rent out to please not a dispensary because there was so many gray market right. dispensaries at that time and they, they they were popping up all over town so they were like we want to rent this office space out and they ended up being to us and that was Moonbase delta we'll talk more about it later but when we moved in people in the ms building were like oh do you make like uh, like prosthetic like, like prosthetics <laughs> or like assistive mobility devices for like you know like those like exoskeleton things and we're like oh oh no no we um we 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 uh make that, uh wiener jokes we 
signed this contract and uh and thus began sort of you know the 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 first step of really actually earning money from from doing this like this was like it was not a huge amount of money in the looking at it now but at the time considering we were going from making nothing like Mm -hmm. banner ads we put banner ads on our website we put adsense banner ads earning like three cent we got briefly banned for like a day and a half or whatever from adsense because a viewer thought they were helping and just kept clicking the banner ads on our website so we got like flagged for for fraud i guess anyway so yeah going from making nothing to making i can't remember what it was it was like it was i don't know like twelve hundred dollars an episode or something like that yeah like it was something which is still frankly a very good rate for that kind of thing and and yeah you multiply it out by you know 52 episodes or whatever yeah and uh yeah it was like and and at that point we also um moved into the first moon base yes yeah because we so now that we actually had like some amount of some amount of actual income because i was when we started unskippable I, i remember this is when i still lived with matt but then in the new year unskippable that was november unskippable didn't begin until january 2009 and when i live with bill and morgan the moon base air quotes was like the back room of their place right then we got proper moon base and then i moved in with matt i'm not entirely sure exactly what the actual timeline is but anyway yeah we got uh two it's about it was about as big as this room that we're in yeah it was it was not big it was i think it was 200 square feet except there was like a chunk taken out of it yeah so it was closer to like 180 square feet or something. Yeah, it was very small. It was very small. Um, we painted one of the walls green. Yeah. So we had a green screen. Um, that's where Desert Bus 2, two happened. Yeah. Where did we get those desks? There was some office. Uh, James. Right. Our landlord who, it, they were just like, it was just like a, a, um, a surplus office stuff that he had. Yeah. We didn't question where it came from. <laughs> we got like some desks and chairs from there yeah uh and he was like yeah if you guys want any of this stuff you, sh- you can have it and we're like cool okay yeah he ran the pedicab company they don't exist anymore but it was basically like a you know like a tourism thing you'd have like a bicycle up front and seat for two in the back and they'd sort of like do tours all around town there's some yeah. pedicabs anymore but these used to be ubiquitous they were all over town but and- they only did they were seasonal right so during the winter when there we didn't have any tourists and nobody wants to ride or drive a pedicab then he would leave to like the turks and caicos and and so the lower the lower whole bunch of the building uh was the pedicab thing and then the upper floor uh was rented out to a few different places yeah i don't remember who was across the hall there was a photography studio at the end of the hall and there was some other stuff we ended up using a lot of different random rooms there there was like some empty rooms in the yeah back by the bathroom it was not so it It was was not ideal um i think that one of the least ideal parts of it uh was that well there was no heating but there was a it was a shared bathroom for the tenants which is that's not atypical for office space that makes Mm. perfect sense um but it was for the like the one two three for like four upstairs units and then the back half of the building was like a trucking company using it as sort of like a warehouse space and they had their own bathroom except when you know one of them really had to go uh do something serious and then they would come and use our bathroom (laughs) never saw one of these human beings but boy did we see what they left behind and (laughs) clogged our toilet with frequently uh but then they left after the back half of the building got condemned did you know that you could condemn condemn just half half of a building (laughs) that was later though yeah, that was no, that no. was later. We weren't paying very much for rent here, at least. Uh, yeah. So so yeah, we had that we had that uh, space mm-hmm. um, for for a while, and uh, we were working with the escapist for a while. Mm-hmm. Now, does it this covers also like E and and stuff? And I don't know if you've ever seen the top speed of an aardvark. Pretty quick. Good day. I'm Graham Stark. And I'm Kathleen DeVere, and here are today's top stories. Is that during this time, or would that be a little bit later? 
ENN uh, was September 2009. So yeah, it was sort of within this, it was still within this this span of time uh, where they were like, you know, asking us for pitches for other stuff. And we were yeah, like, Yeah, so, oh. so we sort of got into, a, we, we were, you know, became quite good friends with Russ, yep. the, uh, who is the editor-in-chief of The Escapist at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think he identified with our, uh, our situation and mm-hmm. stuff, yeah. you know, he, he was, he's also a, a filmmaker and a creative guy. And so he, he was a really positive, um, champion for our yeah. stuff. He worked on like the early days of like tech TV and stuff like that. As yeah, well. yeah. So he, he'd also come from a video production background essentially and uh and so yeah we started we pitched some other things the biggest thing was uh enn so until next time i'm graham and i'm kathleen saying game safely so yeah aardvark's really fast like faster than a lady swallow well, yeah the escapist news network um which was a going to be a video game news show um and also the idea of moving um, the loading ready run sketches mm-hmm. over to the escapist as content. Yeah, that that will be next episode. That that'll be like next yeah. episode. Okay. But for this one, yeah, the uh, we did yeah we did launch and we did a we did a pilot. Um, <laughs> so we were filming this. On, the pilot was just like on a green screen because uh, we didn't have a set built. Obviously, because there was it was just a pilot. Uh, I recall being incredibly sweaty for the actual <laughs> pilot, uh, and uh, Russ was like, "This content's great. Definitely, this is yeah. We want to go forward with this. Uh, consider like I don't know, like some makeup or something. <laughs> uh, definitely, my most memorable uh, filming of the Escapist News Network, which went for a while. Like it went until we got to Moonbase." three but was in moon moon so moon base one because this is all in the same span of time moon base mm-hmm. one was that little tiny room moon base two was across the hall <laughs> because yeah. those people left and our landlord was like do you guys want to move bigger space and we were like yes yes we do there was like two rooms yeah follow me on a tour won't you so in behind this hideous bookshelf we have a piece of drywall here so we put this up put all this up put this up and all of that and that and that and we built out all this crappy wall here and these three sheets of drywall and now we have I this think, one i think you're referring to a different wall because that's not the crappy wall and we had like the the enn set uh that we had sort of set up in the corner yeah this was desert bus three and also, yeah so desert, bus desert three. Bus three okay so this is this was a donation request to have alex do a dramatic reading of the per- first three pages of knee deep in dead issue one and only of the doom comic book. i wish i could make my neck stand out more all right well go for it <clears throat> we filmed a lot of sort of early uh early hustle there more on hustle in a moment actually because that also premiered during this time all right what the hell happened last night well, I just finished my paper in comparative religious themes in late 1980s video games. Wait, and you did a paper on Castlevania? Essentially. Maureen felt it deserved a night out, to which I invited both of you, by the way. I know you didn't show up. Hey, hey, hey. I tried to get in, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, man. Can't let you in. The man draws a fear of beards. You know, we did like a bunch of drywalling. We again, we painted a big green screen wall. We got like our costume racks with the dowels and everything. Which, by the way, those dowels and brackets and shelves, the same ones we're using now. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the ENN set was sort of a bunch of um, the kind of like pebbled piece of plastic that you put into ceiling, like drop T ceiling fluorescent light boxes. So they're like a big rectangle of like this sort of pebbled plastic and so we hung those from strings at different heights and depths and whatever and then put blue t-shirts behind them on a white on a white wall and so the it just they sort of the the light just kind of scattered into like this sort of amorphous blue shape and it just looked kind of like a kind of like a tv set it was neat i yeah i was really pleased with how that set turned out and we could like swap out the t-shirts for different colors for if we wanted to do other stuff yeah we would uh change that out for red shirts for uh when, Ac- we, when we did action, action nine, nine news yeah, yeah. yeah joining us via action nine satellite link to weigh in on this discussion is vivian mangrove assistant professor of astronomy at the university of spuzzum and pollux procyon 
my astrologer. While I can't agree with the theme of today's discussion, it is nice to see the media paying attention to astronomy during the International Year of Astronomy. The International Who of the What Now? So anyway, my most memorable uh, uh, ENN recording on that set was uh, when the in 2010, which is a little outside this episode, but whatever. We, in 2010, when we when the Vancouver Olympics were well i mean we're in vancouver they weren't in town they were in vancouver a lot of people get this geography messed up we're on an island it's called vancouver island and i appreciate the confusion but we we live in victoria the capital city of the province on an island very big island called vancouver island it's not actually that close to vancouver like geographically in terms of the planet sure i guess i guess it's very close to vancouver but you know to get there we take a 25 minute drive to a ferry and then it's a 90 minute ferry and then another 20 25 minute half yeah. hour drive on the other side and then we're in vancouver yeah, where the sort olympics of two or were. three hours from vancouver yeah so the olympics weren't here but still every you know everybody was watching the gold medal men's hockey game we had a really good team that year you know, it's the gold medal game, it's hockey, it's Canada, it's, you know, it's the Olympics there in Canada, it was a big deal. So, you know, so we're like, hey, can we delay recording ENN today? Because we're going to, everyone wants to watch the, watch the hockey game. So we did, we watched the hockey game. Canada wins gold. It was great. Awesome time. We're like, ah, cool. Woo, go Canada. Great. Now let's head downtown and and do this. The the moon base had this giant like door, this this huge, very unsafe like barn, second floor like rolling slidey door thing. Yeah, that uh, in the summer was nice because we could like open it up and just be like, what? There was no railing or anything. It was just floor and then a one story drop to the sidewalk. Uh, we, so we didn't open it that often, but it was cool. You know, we, we did occasional, we did occasional filming with it and stuff and, you know, it was neat, but it meant that there was not a lot of insulation. It did meant, mean also this moon base got very hot in the summer because there was absolutely no insulation at all in the ceiling or anything. Um, but there was certainly also no sound insulation. And so when all of Canada <laughs> is hopped up on, we just won gold medal in hockey, mm. uh, the, the the way that uh, we demonstrate how excited we are, <laughs> apparently, is that we get in our cars, we drive downtown, and then we just go in circles honking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so for hours and hours and hours, people would not stop honking. And the moon, the moon base was not central. It was no. in kind of a crappy location. It was like sort of, yeah, sort of an industrial area. Yeah, but people got to turn around and get to the main streets so people would sit, go by honking and whatever oh, and we're oh, trying oh. to record ENN and it's just <laughs> you know the constant it took us like hours to record this episode because we were just like just trying to get and we didn't for whatever reason we didn't have a teleprompter back then so yeah just, every was, ENN story was memorized yeah this was pre yeah pre-prompter yeah so uh yeah there's a lot of uh memorizing stories and stuff which yeah. is really tricky when and we can talk about more of this later but when enn launched it was the intent was that it was very um it was very dry by design it was much more like the onion when they did the onion news network right uh, yeah it was trying to be very uh yeah very serious yeah so it was sort of everything was presented with the same sort of news based gravitas and it would be like in you know in whatever news this week here are facts from a real story that actually happened and then here's some stuff that we made up but you can't necessarily tell which is which unless you're paying attention to the news anyway uh and so that like that that was the joke right so we'd, we'd start with like here's the setup of a real thing and then be like someone was quoted as saying you know something ridiculous that we made up or whatever because that was and that's the style and it never landed as well as we would have hoped with the escapists audience particularly i mean russ said this later he's like i think it's in our audience problem because again yeah know. i mean and, and like yeah some people liked it that way some people didn't but i mean i sort of talk about sometimes that like the difference between enn and uh checkpoint hmm. is that enn we would be just like lying about yeah. stuff yeah exactly we'd be like a representative from uh xbox said this yeah when they didn't uh, whereas, you know, Checkpoint, we aren't 
we're not usually lying about stuff. We're just, you know, it's it's an opinion thing. Right? Yeah. We're just like, this is stupid for this reason. Yeah. I think this is dumb. We're not saying that. We're not saying that this is uh, what happened. We're saying this would be stupid if it did happen. Yeah, exactly. We also launched in this period of time Commodore Hustle. Right. Which would go on to be one of the more beloved things that we right. do by our viewers anyway. And Which is the thing, right? So Commodore Hustle, the idea behind it mm -hmm. initially was that that it would be a way to expand our audience. Yeah. And it was it was one of the one time like I don't know, maybe the first time or that, that we sort of were like, okay, doing let's do this. Uh, it's a little different than what we what we're used to doing, but uh, it will be something that uh, will expand our audience because it's a different kind of thing, and people will get into the uh, the narrative yeah. stuff. The idea being sort of that, I mean, even back then we identified that sketch comedy is difficult to get a returning audience in that kind of way where you'd have individual sketches that would be very successful and would blow up in a in a significant way but when you have something that has an ongoing narrative and this was the more thing that we really hit on as being a key point but like recurring characters where it was like the same characters every episode right we felt that was a way to get more like we were looking at like homestar Right, like Homestar Runner at that point was huge, and it right. was like because every every time you know what you're getting in for, it's going to be the same, the same characters every time. Whether or not any of this is true, I don't know. But this is this was this was sort of what we, what we had struck upon as like you know recurring characters, ongoing narrative. That's how we can you know build a a, a dedicated audience. As Paul alluded to, uh, turns out. <laughs> So what we're really good at <laughs> is, uh, you know, making stuff that obviously that we find funny. And uh, while we tried to make something that would sort of appeal to a larger audience, um, what we ended up doing is basically making something that was like laser focused <laughs> to appeal to the people who already were our fans. Uh who loved it uh and you know and we really liked it but uh it wasn't actually uh there wasn't actually any i i guess i mean because it, it was you know it was like following us as a sketch comedy troupe mm -hmm. i guess yeah which was probably not a great way to so anyway what it ended up being was, yeah, this uh, something that was sort of this like laser targeted at uh, people who are already our fans, uh, which was great, but not quite what we wanted. I mean, like we even like made like a whole separate website for it yep. that had like a whole different style to it. And it was going to be like a whole thing. And its own YouTube channel at the time when the first season of Commodore Hustle was like 25 minute episodes and you couldn't put videos that long right, on they YouTube. Had a, they had a 10 minute limit. So you had to, I think it was like 15 or something. So we had to cut those hustle episodes into halves, which was really irritating. Mm. Now I will say at the time, this did not have the explosive effect that we, we wanted, but I've been rewatching some episodes of hustle recently. And if you go back and, and look at the view numbers on YouTube, they are higher than a lot of our other stuff. And it's clear from some of the comments that there are people that watch Commodore Hustle that do not watch a lot of our other content. Hmm. And so sort of like it kind of worked eventually, I guess. <laughs> I mean, if you look at if you consider that eventually it would beget Friday nights, then I guess that's another another argument you can have later. Oh, Graham. Oh, hey, hey, guys. What? How's it going? What you doing here? I just wanted to get some card sleeves. But if you look at sort of how Hustle 
started. So we premiered it at the, we had a five year screening. Hey everybody! And welcome to the Loading Ready Run 5th Anniversary Screening. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Down in front! Mm. At, um, it was like, you know, five years of Loading Ready Run. Woo, look, we've done this thing for five years. Can you imagine? We had a cake, uh, and we went to the, uh, the, the theater, the, uh, the Eric Martin. Right, there was, yeah, my dad did, did a, uh, uh, a movie, uh, a weekly movie thing there. So it was just a handy theater that we had access to. Yeah. And we did a whole, we did a screening of some stuff and we did a big Q and A and, uh, there was a bunch of folks there. It was super fun. And then we premiered, you know, the first episode of Commodore Hustle. We didn't have a second episode done at that time. Uh, we were like in our heads, we were like, it's gonna be like a 12 episode season and they're going to be like television like half hour television episode length so like 20 to 25 minutes or whatever and ultimately a big problem that we encountered was that we weren't we'd never done anything like this before so we weren't really good at doing like a narrative serialized thing Mm -hmm. and so a lot of the episodes was sort of like the script was fighting itself for sort of whether it was going with the progression of what a character or a plot line would do naturally versus we know how we want this to end so we have to craft how we get there and sort of force stories or people into specific things to make the end result turn out the way we want Uh, did you put milk in your tea yeah so do you yeah but that's green tea i'm pretty sure that's bad luck Sorry, what? Yeah, milk and green tea, that's bad luck right there. Yeah, plus it's weird. What you said about the tea, it came true. Wikipedia, Jer. The internet doesn't lie. It's like everything I touch is jinxed. No, like like that Skittles ad where everything he touches turns into Skittles. I was thinking King Midas, but yeah. I'm not familiar with that. And also just like random jokes. Yeah, oh, and then also make it funny throughout. That aren't necessarily like tied to the... Yeah. Narrative. Yeah. I love to land. Pew 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 pew. Plug and play and pwn. I love to land. Q q q q. Time for some noobs to get on. Was that Mary Poppins? Uh, yeah. Oh, you suck. Hey, you recognized it. Chim chim chira, asshole. The thing is, we literally did not know where it was going when we started. <laughs> Um, a TV show where you don't know how it's how where, where the the creators and writers don't know how it's going to end and they're just kind of making it up as they go along. <laughs> Can you imagine such a thing? We we didn't use a smoke monster. We did it. We did have a man dressed like a bear though. Oh, oh God! God! A bear! One to the land and one to the sea. So it is writ in the ancient decree. But tonight. It will be shark meat for me! For me! Okay, we're we're done. You, you don't wanna No, I do not. It's true. So that was fun. You know, I still I mean I I still think that the first season of Hustle for all that it all that it was or all that it tried to be uh, was honestly pretty great considering who, who we were when we were making it mm-hmm. and just sort of figuring this all out live in front of an internet audience. Uh, you know, like I think that there's things I would have done differently, but ultimately I'm really sort of pleased with it. And so we did that and it was like, great, there's hustle, you know, now what? And then we eventually would do other stuff and then it sort of turned into more of a, uh, you know, we we did eventually, years later, sort of make the decision that it would be not, n- there would be continuity, but not a narrative. Yeah. Right? Where it's like, if something happened in one episode, that thing still happened in the next episode. Like, that, that is a thing that had, had happened in the past of this world, but not that it was like, not that every ep- not that there was story arcs or not that every episode was necessarily mm-hmm. leading to something. We 
pretty much figured that out after the first season. Yeah. That we would do it that way. Yeah. And I think that has served us well for Commodore Hustle mm-hmm. uh, as we went through different iterations of it. I should say that, like, I think where we're at, obviously at time of recording now, we haven't done an episode in a couple of years for pandemic reasons, obviously. But uh, we... I th- I think the sort of the the style that we kind of slipped into in Moonbase Five was even even less structured, where it was much more like a I don't know, sort of like I guess maybe like The Simpsons, where it's just every every episode. Not that not that everything goes back to zero at the end of the episode. You know, like things like we introduce Pistachio, and then Pistachio is around, right? right? Oh no, I'm not supposed to make people angry. I'm supposed to help us actualize our human capital. Also, make us a more agile and synergistic organization. But, you know, it's not necessarily that, like, uh, someone's... I don't know. There's 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 some magical realism things that happen that don't necessarily get referenced later. I'm trying to make a super distilled blend of all the extra coffee we have at the moon base, and I need a living subject to log the side effects, take iterative notes. Oh. I already know how to transmute the coffee of life, if you want some help with that. I didn't know you had experience with caffeinated super serums. I don't talk about it much. But, I mean, the time door sticks around. That ends up being a thing. I guess maybe it's not as extreme as I thought. Well, ain't that some shit? We should send someone in there. Not it. Yeah, fuck every part of that. Also, um, at this time and, and involved with uh, Commodore Hustle is when we uh, ran, when uh, Tim yeah. started being involved with the, uh, uh, with the site. All right, Tim, you're not Stockholm anymore. In recognition of your devotion and service, you are now an official member of the Loading Ready Run crew. You're one of us now, Tim. Yay. Yeah, loading time. So this was, I mean, for years I'd been wanting to do like, you know, like, boy, I wish we could do behind the scenes stuff. Because I love behind the scenes stuff. I mean, we both do, right? Like we, we even talked earlier about how, you know, behind the scenes things at all was a big part of how I started doing the 3D stuff. It's just yeah. watching the behind the scenes things for Mist and everything. And uh, it's, I, I, I miss I miss in-depth DVD special features, you know, as I... I absorbed literally every part of the lord of the rings you know uh, special features and all that stuff and uh, just i i crave behind the scenes content because it it's it's inspiring you know like in a in a in a literal sense if i can see it and be like oh what a neat idea what can we do that's anywhere approaching something that complicated right and i would love to do i would at the time i was like i'd love to do behind the scenes stuff but we're all busy making right. the the, 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 in, the, the in front of scenes yeah exactly so we can't you know we can't really do that and then uh, i get a dm on the forum and we'll talk about more of this with tim in a little bit but I, you know, we talk about uh that but i got this dm and he was like hey have you ever thought of doing this <laughs> and i was sort of like yes i have thought of that but thank you very much for asking and then it was like well i i have a camera and free time why don't i why don't i come down and we'd met Tim before this at Desert Bus. Again, you'll be seeing him shortly. But, you know, I was like, yeah, sure, I guess come on down. And so he would show up and he would film them and he would edit them. And then it was great. Like, hey, finally, we have a thing for this. And then slowly we would absorb him into our collective. You're one of us now, Tim. Hmm. Which sounds a little bit more uh, uh, freaky than I intended it to. But... But I mean, that, if you say I, it like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean that was that, that was the point. I was going for the joke, but then it, it sounded even weirder. Anyway, um, but I guess yeah. I guess let's I guess let's talk with Tim. I guess yeah. that was a fine time to do that. And so yeah, this was a this was a big couple of years. Um, we started actually getting paid for stuff, and we started you know, really earning really earning money. And this is when I mean, I guess uh, to put a button on that between unskippable and especially for ENN, this is when I stopped, I stopped doing normal jobs. I, yeah. And I I remember, especially after we, because the, the contract for ENN was quite a bit higher than the, uh, than Unskippable. Yeah. Like ENN was a larger production. Like, so 
you know, and, and Russ understood that, and the escapes understood that. So we were being paid quite well. And like, I remember that, you know, this was 2008, 2009, you know, economic downturn worldwide. Yeah. And the at that recession. same time, I remember talking to my parent, like, you know, I just, we don't have the money yet, but I just signed a contract for like a quarter of a million dollars. Right. <laughs> for the next, like, two, I think it was for, for like a year or two years or something. Yeah. And I was like, that, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we were still working, like you were still doing web dev stuff. I was still yeah. doing video stuff or whatever, but this was like, okay, I don't need to work at ICBC anymore, which is good. Cause my contract was up in at the end of the year, right? It was only seasonal until like, I think it, I think it wrapped up at the end of December anyway. And so it was like, okay, you know, I, I don't need to scramble to look for another job. Like I'm not going to be earning very good money compared to what I was earning at ICBC. I'm going to be earning very little, but it's enough. And it, and it and it the idea being, if if I can survive on this money th and then use my time to then focus on making other stuff good for Loading Ready Run, then hopefully that will beget more right. money, and then it will sort of get to a point. And you know what? Twenty years in, we're almost there. <laughs> 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 but uh yeah that that was sort of the that was the beginning of of all that being all that being possible so now let's uh catch up i was so happy that he was able to do this let's catch up with tim and now i'm here with paul and tim hello it's tim hey. hello thanks for thanks for joining us yeah, no, I'm glad to be able to, to come down. We don't live too far apart now, so. Yeah, I actually, it's, I mean, you said you lived there for like five or six years now. I actually did not realize how close we lived now, but for a while we did not, you see. Mm. Uh, the last time that Tim would have been in something that we've produced was, we were talking about this beforehand, it was like nine years ago. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was the uh, Loading Ready Rumble 2. So, uh, I've been in a fight to the death before. The pay's no good, but the benefits were to die for. Right, which is sort of the finale of the sketches. Yeah, exactly. And we I remember at the time, we again, we talked about this after Tim got here this morning. We remember at the time we were like, we want to have Tim in because Tim was around for several years. He was, a, you know, he was definitely a part of Loading Ready Run during that time. So we want to have Tim in this video. What character, characters, character yeah. has Tim ever played that's like a distinct yeah, character. and a lot of one-offs that were like not necessarily stand out. Yeah, so you know, so that's why we ended up going with the 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 roommate who is an annoying acoustic guitar accompanied stand-up comedian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I first plugged it into my computer, it told me it was syncing. I thought I was trying to download emo music. I'm not gonna solo around me. I'm sinking to the gloomy depths. Does anyone else out there like emo music? I've got to admit, I'm a huge fan. I was in an emo band once. We were called Merc. We used to turn off all the lights in the stadium and play completely in the dark. And it really set the mood, you know. Plus, it made it easier to lip sync. Get it? Lip sync. Which I, I felt good about that selection, too, because I wrote that sketch, exactly. right? So yeah. it's like, okay, yeah, no, this feels like a good, like, land on that. This is different. What? Who are you? I've been in a fight to the death before. The pay's no good, but the benefits were to die for. I took a shiv to the stomach. My mother-in-law cried over the wound, but I think she just wanted to get some salt in there. You know, my emo band Merc got strangled once, but I think it was an accident. Good shot. I was aiming for the one with the guitar. Belgian piece of shit. <laughs> Forgive me for uh, for saying you, you. To my mind, you look exactly the same. <laughs> You do not look like you have aged a day. Well, I could throw that right back at you guys, Aww. but you know, I got I, you would be lying. I got I, I got I, I got curly hair now. Ooh, so oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. is that true for me? Um, going way back to uh, before you even were sort of hanging around uh, week to week. Like, what's the what's the 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 Tim in LRR origin story? Because I mean, yeah. from our perspective, you just sort of were like, hey, I want to. I'm going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the details a little more than that. So it, it actually, it started cause I was, I was studying at UVic at the time and I was in a computer science class with Jer. Oh, 
Yeah, we were in the same class, and at one point he went up in front of the class ahead of the first desert bus, and oh. he promoted desert bus to the class. Like, hey, we're doing this thing. You know, you should watch oh. and donate. It'll be cool. I'm like, that sounds really interesting. I actually had no idea about yeah. that because I knew that the first time we ever actually met you was the first desert bus, but yeah. I didn't. I did not know that Jared had done that. It's so amazing. I, I don't remember exactly how you know the the small steps in between, but you know, I. I I think he had left some contact info or something, or I just got in touch via the stream itself once it had started and kind of invited myself over to, to come hang out at Desert Bus the first time. And I brought along, I, th I probably went to like Thrifty Foods or something and I bought a chocolate bunt cake and I brought I remember, that along and cake. that was like, hey, here I am and, and I brought a cake. And, and, <laughs> and yeah, first year Desert Bus, we were very like... You're around? Come over, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Right? The first two or three. Bring food. By I think the third one, it was starting to get a little like, uh, maybe don't just randomly show up <laughs> yeah, and yeah. drop food off. We and this is getting weird. <laughs> yeah. The first one, definitely, there was people that we'd never met before yeah. that were like, hey, I live in town. Can I come by? And we were just like, yup, here's the address. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, thinking about it now, obviously, that's a silly idea, but whatever. We were, you know, the first internet uh fundraising gaming marathon so figure that had to figure all that stuff out as we yeah. went hmm. so yeah we're, brought, brought did, by a chocolate cake did you actually like were you actually like around at desert bus for a long time i yeah i don't remember i, I hang out for like at least a few hours that first time and i think i might have come back one other time I during think so. it and it lasted like five days roughly yeah the Something first time there yeah i've, I've obviously so, vague very vague recollections of that yeah the first I, th desert I think bus. i was there a couple of times uh and then again a gap and i don't remember exactly how that led to it but i don't know if you guys invited me to come hang out sometime or if it was just you know, I remember kind of the in that I used was I said, hey, I've got my own camera. Mm -hmm. Why don't I film you guys making a sketch and produce a behind the scenes video for you guys? I remember right. the discussion. This was... And I kind of pitched it to you. It was a DM on the Loading Ready Run forums. Oh, was it? Yeah, I remember this. And uh, yeah, you're like, hey, this Well, me. you couldn't slide into Twitter DMs at that point because exactly. Twitter didn't exist. Yeah. And it was great because if I recall correctly, you were like, hey, I think it would be really good if you did behind the scenes content. And I agreed in because I already wanted to do that, right? So I was like, yes, I totally agree. And you'd said, well, I have my own camera and I can just like come and film stuff. And so it was like, okay, sure. <laughs> then, we, then we don't have to think about it. And so that was that yeah. was the beginning of uh, loading time. Yeah. Oh, hey, what's up? Where are we playing? Sorry, I didn't see you there. Uh, oh, quite literally. It's the only time I've ever said that without being sarcastic. So do we want to do it? That's the like the the key element to to integrating into the loading ready run thing it's like if you can be like i'm gonna do this and you don't have to do any more work yeah i'll just do this yep uh that was uh, extremely uh interesting for us i wonder if i can still log into the forum <laughs> try to find that back so yeah I, I did that video and did a few more uh and it just got to be a bit more of a regular thing like i don't think i was there every weekend at first but then it turned into just being there every weekend and it kind of snowballed as the the thing that happens with everybody is if you're sort of around then you'll start being like hey we need somebody to hold the boom hey yeah. we need somebody to do this hey we need somebody in the in this shot yeah, put on this costume and say this line on, oh, yeah okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps going around along that way until you're uh more yeah. deeply integrated in I have a bunch of DMs, but uh, <laughs> I don't I have some unread ones. I have a DM from Tim about forum ranks. Ooh. Oh, right. Yeah, because like it, one of the things that I started to do more over time, other than just being involved in the sketches, was just like kind of being a community manager in a sense, right? Sure, like, yeah. We did a little bit of that. Like we had some some contests and we did some pretty early live streaming stuff mm -hmm. um, from from the Moonbase. We'd play. It was on like UStream or something. Oh yeah, because Twitch didn't exist. <laughs> exactly. There was also infamously the what the most uh, famous piece of unfinished community engagement that we ever did. Which uh, do you remember this? I'm do you not remember sure. Tube Men Enter? Yes. <laughs> Right. I don't remember what it is, but I remember that phrase. So we oh, was it? We did a start of a sketch, and they had to finish it. Or yeah, something and we like never shot the other half. <laughs> yeah, it was James had two really, really big cardboard, cardboard tubes. tubes. Yes, it was like, and we had you and uh, Matt Wiggins, uh, uh -huh. like facing off against each other in this very and they like, had to, dramatic like, pitch the ending. 
Uh, it was like an anime setup for like you yeah. both, each of you had one of these tubes and you were about to fight. And then we were like, all right, community, how does the sketch end? And we got all the submissions and there were some really good ones in there. And the in- intent was that we were then going to film the one that we liked at the end of it. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, we just never did. And then eventually... It's like know, time like, went by and so it wasn't like summer anymore. So it was yeah. hard to shoot outside and then mm-hmm. we, we lost the tubes and those... Yeah. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, we got the first half of it, so there's that. We certainly made a lot of hay uh, in the in the first years there of like, haha, it's Matt and Tim, yeah. and, which was, I mean, a, a lot of that was community driven, but like, because we kept being like, we don't think they look that similar. They're just both <laughs> like nice blonde guys, blonde with hair, glasses. glasses, bit of a round face. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> all right, I guess, yeah, sure. Well, and that's when you know I started growing facial hair more. Mm. Right. You know, specifically in response to that. <laughs> I yeah. like, Honestly, yeah. I think there was a little bit of that. <laughs> and and uh, I still wear a beard to this day. Mm-hmm. I think most people having blonde hair, unless it's actually quite thick, you don't really notice it that much. Mm. Like your your mind doesn't like focus on it, at least. And so mm-hmm. it didn't actually help. <laughs> <laughs> sort of rewinding back to the back to loading time. So then basically Tim would show up and film while we were doing a sketch. And then take the footage away and yep. you do the edit yourself yep. and then be like, here's an episode of loading time. And we'd start, yep. we'd start airing those. In fact, I think also you did like the first, um, uh, sort of the first like kind of vlog stuff where we were going to PAX. Yeah. Make film now. I am. Tim is make film. Hi, Tim film. Hello. We're in the Boston. There isn't any hot water in our shower. Yay. Well, because I got an iPhone 3G that could shoot video. <gasps> you guys had gotten iPhones. Right. And they, iPhone 3s, you know, yeah. look at this camera. It's got a camera on my phone. And then I got the iPhone 3G, which could do video. And so I, I would film a little bit of stuff just as we were walking around. I think it was probably going to Boston because we flew. We were in the Boston. We didn't fly to Seattle for PAX. Oh, yeah, right. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did do, you definitely edited something of, of us going to PAX West. Yeah. As it was just PAX at the but, time. But, but yeah, the I thing that PAX I East, remember yeah. that was really interesting going to Boston for PAX East was that I actually used my phone, connected it to Wi-Fi on the plane, and actually streamed a little a little community thing with whoever was sitting with wow. me. I don't remember who was sitting with me, but we talked, we streamed a little bit, uh, I don't know, 30 people. I do not remember that. You can't do that anymore because no, they lock can't. down their Wi-Fi if they even have it. But oh man, <laughs> oh that reminds me. This is totally unrelated to Tim, but you you would have been involved in this. Do you remember? Um, uh, uh, I'm curious if James remembers this. Do you remember uh, the Traveler Twitter account? Right. Yeah. 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 Sending text messages was like very expensive. Seventy five cents a text. Yeah. Or something. And so we set up this like private community like communal twitter account called traveler as in like traveler oh, yeah, yeah um yeah. and uh uh the idea being that this was like we all posted to their to communicate with to, one another to yeah. communicate with with one another um the the <laughs> there's a i i, I, I want to see if i can find it because there there's an avatar that kathleen drew <laughs> uh because we were like Yes, it's Travis Lorar. Because <laughs> it's tra- cause we were yeah. all, all of our Twitter accounts were like name underscore LRR. Yeah. So Traveler is Trav underscore LRR. And so we're like, <laughs> what's this name? And so it's like Travis Lorar. And so it's a drawing of like, it's this drawing Kathleen did of a Frenchman. <laughs> this, this, and, but this is all like a private account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and this is all a workaround because nowadays if you had an internet connection to send this, you would just use WhatsApp or, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. all sorts of ways but to do it But those didn't exist at the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> so. The bio, my name is Lorar. I run with the wind. I'm silent at first, but loud at the end. <laughs> So weird. <laughs> it's very strange. We used to be, so, we did a whole did a whole like backstory for Travis here. So <laughs> when you came over for for like Desert Bus and stuff, did you know what Loading Ready Run was in the larger context? I don't remember specifically, but I think I had looked it up a little bit. I probably I probably had watched some of the videos and thought, hey, this is really cool. And you know, I'd done a little bit of just messing around with video and things like that on my own, but nothing really public. Mm. And so I, it kind of like you know touched on some of my sensibilities right <laughs> being silly and <laughs> making videos and being on the internet so and then eventually uh because as what happens if someone hangs around enough eventually 
we you were using you in sketches and stuff yeah. too, rather than just being the behind the scenes guy. Right, which uh, meant that we lost our behind the scenes stuff. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, do you do you remember? Because I have it written down. Because James wrote them all down. Your first, uh, your first appearance. No, on camera mm. appearance. I do not. Uh, according to this, it is according to the wiki anyway. It is emergency situation. The great thing about this touch interface is that it's so natural. You can pinch things down. You can spread pictures out. What about its pornographical capabilities? Well, that's where it gets interesting, because you remember what I said about the touch interface. That knocking noise is really getting distracting. Right. We're that... dressed up as guards. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That was. Uh, I that think was I remember the... the sketch, but I don't remember that being the first. Huh. Joke at Matt's expense. <laughs> Joke at Matt's expense. Uh, who the hell are you? Hmm. Joke at Matt's expense. Clever addition to joke at Matt's expense. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a green screen one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was mostly green screen. Okay, I might be thinking of something else. I'm thinking of one where like there were a couple of guards behind a desk and then somebody got shot and I ran up and I was like, uh, Dear Lord! Dear Lord. Oh, no, no. Oh, no that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a different, different one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was later. It's a bird! It's a plane! No, it's a bird. Why are you so excited about a bird? I like birds. And so yeah, then then Tim got involved in like writing stuff as well, as you said, like yeah, you wrote that, few. that that one sketch there as uh, as well. And yeah, because there, there's that there was a uh, because you were working at the time for uh, like BC Hydro yeah. Green Initiative thing. Yeah, and that that kind of put it in my head. So I wrote, I think it was just called Green. It was an, another sketch about yeah, we're we're yeah, Morgan and I trying to one up each other. Oh, yeah, right. and Morgan and I yeah. ended up like painted entirely green. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. Hmm. Uh. Hi there, Steph. Isn't St. Patrick's Day in March? <laughs> Forgot about that one. <laughs> Good times. Yeah. It's got a really good stinger, that one, I like. <laughs> By the end of the setup, we're both trying to one-up and, and win Tally's affections with how environmentally friendly we are mm. and failing spectacularly at it. And then it was something to do with, like, you guys are both literal trash or something like that. And so we both, the stinger is us both inside garbage cans. I'm a better green person, right? Tell me I am! Tell me I am! I'm better trash than you. I'm, I'm better trash than you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, your first writing credit, actually, is Easy Bake Spore. Matt, I told you not to blow up my place again. Yo, you're not Matt. You're not Optimus Prime. Sorry. The Spore Creature Creator Home Kit. Fun for the whole family. <laughs> Remember Spore? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't ever played the game, but it was enough of a prompt to, to write something off of. And that one's a, a full play on the me and Matt thing. Yeah. The, uh, the writing credit for this one is... Loading Ready Run and Tim Sevenhusen. Mm. So I think what that was, was you were like, I have this idea and I have some bits for it. Is this anything? Yeah. And then we were like, yes, let's yeah, take it and do it, a yeah. thing of it. I, I happen to be, so I've been going through um, <laughs> my t-shirt archive over the course oh. of these episodes. And today I am wearing, is somebody doing science in here? Yeah. Is that this one? Is somebody doing science in here? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, it holy totally crap! Is. At the, that's at just the, the very... little like side of frame jump in, and yeah, it says the, that's a the stinger line. at the very end. Because yeah. Paul the scientist was such a thing, right? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It was a recurring gag. Well, there we go. Yeah, that happened to work out very well then. <laughs> it's, so I get muddy on like what eras of t-shirt I'm supposed yeah. to be wearing for a given episode. So I have an <laughs> extensive uh, collection of t-shirts that I never wear, but I'm not willing to throw away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so then, but. Speaking of Commodore Hustle, yeah. So we we started that as a series um, uh, a little while later, yeah. Um, into this sort of era, mm -hmm. uh, and in the first in the first season, we were very ambitious with like a, a whole sort of story arc, yeah. And part of that was uh, Jeff was our nemesis. Mm -hmm. So this whole. Use assumed names on various websites to post harmful rumors and alienate their fan base. That's the entire plan? Of course not, Tim. That'd be terrible narrative progression. We gotta build up their torment. 
We gotta keep this slow and painful. Which is the same way they kill puppies? Tim, you're a natural. Actually, that worries me a little. Even though we didn't really know that he was our nemesis. And the idea was Tim was his, like, assistant. Yeah, I worked for him. Yeah. And I was, like, the comic foil, like, doesn't know what's going on, but sure, right. I'll do this evil thing for you. But, you, but the idea was that you were actually, like, kind of, like, fans of our stuff. Or, or <laughs> I don't know if you were fans of our stuff or you were just, you were, like, uh, uh, you actually ended up liking us better yeah. than him. Now we know where Jeff lives. Which is great, except now we have Stockholm Syndrome here. <laughs> you guys are awesome. We all are pretty nifty. Which yeah, is weird, because like, I was like hustle, friendly with you guys. Our hustle characters are not great people. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and then we were going to, we, we like integrated you into uh, the like, hey, you can be part of our group now. Yeah. And then you were like. So I gave her one of these. So instead of children, I've decided to get more cats. A parody of MASH, but we'll make the theme song Genocide is Painless. Um, I don't think this is gonna work. What's wrong? Well, I mean, it was all fine when I idolized you guys, but now that you're no more special than I am, I've realized you're terrible people. That was like, yeah, <laughs> that was that was the like the transition out, because around yeah. that time is when I was like, hey, you know, like I need to go focus on other things in my life kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. And so we did that and we shot a bit because Alex was starting to get more involved at that point. Mm -hmm. And we did a bit where we did that as the pre, the pre roll to a video basically. Yeah. I'm leaving now. And I'm keeping the shirt. Oh, how long were you down there? I lost the contact lens. You wore glasses. Uh, that was the magic episode. Okay, that was what started Friday nights. So that's four damage to your nether whore and two to you. Oh, suck. Guys, the line is moving. Da, 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 da. And now we're all playing. We're not all playing. I have no interest in this. But, but look, there's, there's cat cards. I could make a deck entirely with kitties? Yes. <gasps> that ended up being the Magic the Gathering yeah. episode. But yeah, because the joke was, uh, was that in, in Hustle continuity, anyway, that Tim wasn't part of Loading Ready Run. Right. But then had been like hanging out. Like after the stuff with Jeff, Tim just sort of kept hanging out, I guess. Yeah. Behind the scenes, obviously, we considered Tim part of Loading Ready Run for a while before that, uh, just to be clear. But in the story, it was like, uh, here you go. You get your t-shirt and now you're finally part of the crew. Yeah. You're one of us now, Tim. Yay. And well, and there's like, the whole like the, the Stockholm nickname or whatever like that that oh, developed for right. them as like Stockholm yeah. syndrome. And now we have Stockholm syndrome here. I completely forgot yeah. about that. Yep, I'd forgotten about that too. And a couple of years ago, somebody referred to me that way. I don't remember his social media or something else. I'm like, huh, good for you. You wow. know, <laughs> you know your lore. <laughs> going going deep on the lore. All right. Yeah, but then yeah, so then I did the walk off, and then Alex popped up as a as a direct replacement in the bottom of the frame. So yeah. <laughs> It's like he was on funny a transition. Something. It was good, yeah. I've been looking at the page on the on the wiki, sort of the the filmography to get kind of like a slice of sort of, you know, when you were really mm -hmm. prominent in stuff. And it's sort of, you know, two thousand eight through twenty ten. Um the last in, in in fact literally your last appearance is November twenty ten, mm -hmm. which was that's the magic episode. You're terrible people. And then got you back for two cameos. In season eight, uh, one yeah. for the... So it still would have been in Victoria at that point. Yeah, for uh, rent. On the first Monday of the month, they take all the tenants down to the basement. You're all attached to the temporal succutron. The what? It's not as fun as it sounds. And I use it to take your Monday. What, the whole day? 24 hours. Though, you're only going to lose about 16 or so, depending on how much you sleep. And the tale of Matt Wiggins. But, I mean, a lot of people were in the tale of Matt Wiggins. Baby, he's a grad student. Bitless Timothy is his name. Different person. Or you can call him Gannon, filling everyone with shame. You know what? Fine. You guys getting coffee? Okay, I'll have a mocha. We're referencing the, the, the Matt and Tim thing. I like, mm. it says, appearing. Tim Seven Hughes, an uncredited. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, and then... <laughs> a uh, f telephone cameo in Commodore Hustle, the B team. So Graham texted me earlier this week. Okay, okay, twitchy. He texted me earlier this week to see if I wanted to be in a video. Uh, I don't know exactly what the whole video is about. I've just really read my lines and heard something about some bees, which sounds funny. 
but uh, I figured that the excuse for my lines was going to be that I just had a baby, which is true. And this is Calvin. He's eight days old. And so we figured, hey, why not bring him by, get him in shot, add a little bit of extra flavor to the video. Seems like he's going to enjoy it. He'll sleep through the whole thing, probably. I don't remember that at all. So this is the episode of Commodore Hustle where it's 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 called the B Team, B-E-E, because we get sent a box of live bees uh but also because it's like a lower decks episode and so it's uh tally cameron kate and dale mm. and they're trying to get more help and they phone you okay and there's a shot of you with your child okay <laughs> i'm looking at the wiki here <laughs> mean like i'm busy it notes calvin was eight days old when this scene was filmed <laughs> i was gonna say yeah like let's around the time i think i had one at that point yeah, yeah. making making them the uh, youngest actor to ever appear in a loading ready run video until an even younger penelope appeared at desert buzz nine Ooh. that's not a loading ready run video so mm. calvin yeah. still gets it <laughs> this is penelope she is six days old so she's making her first on-camera appearance which i think is very important to uh, so <laughs> Everybody, so yay! Everybody's very happy. Yay. I am actually most happy right now because I'm not wearing any maternity clothes. <laughs> did we get you to come to the moon base? Why? How did we do this? I don't even remember. Probably just got him to film himself. Probably we just asked you to film something yourself. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Tim was just in town and we're like, hey, can you come by for this? Well, yeah, no, we still lived in Victoria at that point. Oh, okay. Okay. He was, he was born here, so. Well, there we go then. Yeah, probably brought him by. <laughs> I think pro people probably wanted to meet him too, like. Oh, you know, yeah. we were still like, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, in each yeah. other's lives it wasn't a little like, bit. <laughs> yeah, I should mention it wasn't like you know we did the it's magic episode and then Tim just ceased to exist. You know, yeah, it just was uh, wasn't involved all the time anymore. No, I mean, you know, you had your own priorities, right? It was yeah. like uh, I was in grad school at that point. Yeah, and had just gotten married or was it just about to get married, and then Calvin came along. You know, so which you know, I, life was changing a yeah, lot. But like from our perspective, it was really funny actually because it was you know it was we had sort of you know different uh life philosophies i suppose <laughs> and so you were to our perspective it was tim it was like okay well tim graduated and then he's gonna immediately get married and have a kid so just bang <laughs> bang bang right yeah and uh that was not the experience for most of the rest of us yeah yeah you went up to grad school mm -hmm. um and then what what were you what, what did you end up studying and so i i was doing a master's in sociology at uvic oh cool so yeah, so I, I you were did doing that. a master's when you were doing loading ready run stuff. Well, I, I think I was part way into it when I so I, I finished my bachelor's degree in '08. Yeah, I think I was in my thesis portion of my master's when I kind of finished things off. But yeah, so wow. those couple of years, I don't remember 2009, I, 2010. I was I was doing a master's program. Bad memory. And for finished years off ago. the thesis 2011. Nice. Um, and after that, we uh, so my wife and I took our one child <laughs> and we moved to Edmonton for work because I, so I got a job there and spent four and a half years there, had three more kids. So we have four now. What? <laughs> and, and Calvin is 11. He just got home from camp yesterday. Nice. His second oh. summer at camp. So had a great time. Spent some time there for work. Uh, I worked in market research for a while. Um, and then went into the provincial government, mm. spent a couple years there. And finally, we're like, okay, Edmonton's nice. You know, it's a, it's a pretty good city. It's got, you know, weather we don't love so much. <laughs> but a lot of sunshine is great, but it's not home. That's why, like, there's, like, like five Albertans on, former Albertans <laughs> on the crew currently for, mostly for weather reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the one big plus, they got sun all the time. Yeah, we moved back to, to BC, to the island. I'm um, living in Nanaimo now. Uh, and it's just, you know, we wanted to raise our kids closer to family. My parents are a 10 minute walk away. Nice. School's in between us. So, That's great. you know, so it, it's really great having, having that kind of family community. We've been there for about six years now. That's the, the little, the little life summary. Hmm. <laughs> what do you, what, uh, what, I mean, I guess then sort of a, how do I feed them? No. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, that was, I was actually going to rewind, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what do you do for a, for what do you do now? 2015, I started a League of Legends esports stats website called mm -hmm. Oracle's Elixir. Um, just cause I needed a hobby. I, I can't, you know, I, I don't 
do well if I don't have something I'm working towards that I'm really passionate about and work was not doing it for me. Mm. I do so, I do remember looking up on Twitter once so sort of being like, what's Tim up to these yeah. days? And and you were, were like tweeting some like very granular stats about League of Legends. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. what in the heck? <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of got involved in, in League Esports. Uh, creating the website led to different kinds of content creation. Uh, I, I did some freelance writing. Um, eventually, 2017, I entered esports full time. Um, I was working for a company based out of Berlin that uh, that created subscription platforms for professional teams, so they could subscribe, use use the tools and data that we provided. Uh, did that for a couple of years. Still working esports full time. I've had various different roles in it. I, I've done other kinds of kind of third party platforms, whether I'm kind of leading the product or doing software development or data science or things like that. Um, also, I've worked inside professional teams, running their, you know, analytics departments, things like that. So I, I love all that over the, the industry. <laughs> I, I love that the, the like data analytics stuff from, you know, sociology mm. and government things. Yeah. Obviously, you know, data is data, yeah. right? It, it, it applies to all these other yeah, things. Yeah, you well. can find ways to, you know, you, you can find ways to apply it. The actual methods you use are going to be quite different depending on what kind of answers you're trying to find, what kind of questions you're asking. But if you know how to work with data, and I think the biggest thing is I, I taught myself a lot of a lot of coding mm. that, uh, you know, so that I can actually take raw data. <laughs> and, and there are a lot of people out there, they ask me all the time, you know, how do I get into esports analytics? You know, I've got, I've done this data science program or I've studied math or whatever. And they say, well, learn to code because nobody's going to hand you clean data to work with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, learn to build a data pipeline and set up a database now you can do the part you actually want want to do and be interested in. So that's that's what I've spent a lot of time learning on my own. This is almost sort of like the uh, the like Moneyball thing, yeah. but applied to esports yep. as opposed to baseball or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And there there are certain similarities. There are certain differences. The games themselves are so different. The way you get data is so different. But it's the same kind of like set of problems you're trying to solve. How do we find the right players and build the right team? How do we prepare for our opponents and what are they going to do? And how do we like exploit that and understand the changes in the game itself? All those kinds of things. Wow. That, that, that's super cool. So you have like all the information on not only your team yeah. and stuff, but also the other teams be like, hmm, this is what you need. These are strategies that will work well against these guys. Yeah. Stuff. I love that. Yeah, it's fun. Now I'll rewind <laughs> back to, uh, you know, sort of what are your, uh, any any kind of standout recollections from from your time doing loading ready run? Yeah, I think I think we talked about some of them. You know, some those PAX trips that we went on. You know, the it was the very first PAX I think we went to. Mm -hmm. I am going to force you to watch all of that because I was up until four a.m. editing yesterday's loading time just for you, and I feel it's respectfully spiteful to do so. It's quarter to nine. And I believe that adds up to, <laughs> what does that add up to for sleep? And, yeah. you know, that was a big, and that's, you know, where they handing out, Watsi was handing out the magic packs, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and that letting to all that, that was a, that was a really cool trip. And then in PAX East as well, Boston was really cool. And I think, I think East, I think that East is the one where we shot the, the episode of Hustle at PAX, like in the, mostly in the hotel room. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The, the like. Yeah, that whole the whole like everyone was like slept in or something. I like these trips fine, but can we get more beds next time? Yes. It's not so bad. It's warm at least. Come on, Matt. It's pretty bad. No, no, I'm with Matt. I like the warmth. It's like having a sleepover again. I just remember it ended up with a bunch of people all all in the shower at once. Yeah. yeah. No, I said no talking. And there was some uh, audience participation during the panel or something like that, like. I yeah, think. there was the bit with we had. I think right. it was Russ. It was one 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 person just like sitting at the panel thing, being like, "So they're they're going to be here real soon." Um, so, so I'm going to tell you a story. So I was looking for the. Yeah, we were like, "All right, we need everyone to play along and look really bored and unimpressed," <laughs> uh, and they did. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> they did it very well. Yeah, strange how they were able to do it so it's easily. Weirdly, weirdly well. Hmm. <laughs> and, and there was, uh, you know, I think one of the, the most exciting or impressive moments is when, when we faked all the viral videos for that one Hustle episode. We need to go viral. But Morgan's not here. No, video. Viral video. We need to come up with ideas that'll get us the mad views, yo. 
Oh, right. yes. Right, because you were in the uh, nunchuck jousting. That's right. Yeah, you, Tim was the other... The, the my, other jouster. My competitor in the yeah. nunchuck jousting video. Do you I think un- I won, technically, right? I like, guess, yeah. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I, got a, I got an own goal. Yeah. Uh, the, um, <laughs> the, the original YouTube upload of that is still technically there, but I, it was deactivated like a year or two ago for... Uh, YouTube's new like encouraging violent acts policy, really? which I find very funny. That is it's funny. like, it's like no, uh, but like before it had been taken down, I think it was up to like seven hundred thousand views, mm. which which is a lot, obviously. Um, but the the scope of viewership of that video is incalculable. Yeah, because it has appeared. Uh, it got like so we signed a bad contract and it got sub licensed a bunch. So someone made a bunch of money off of it. We made we made a bunch of money off of it, but not that much. And someone else made a whole bunch of other money off of it, licensing it, it out to like, yeah, you know, like uh, Rob Deerdeck's ridiculousness and uh, Fail Army and mm. True although, TV. Although a lot of those places don't actually pay anything for clips. It's they're they're like, supposed to. Wow. Well. <laughs> uh, well, usually what it is is that like uh, it'll be. Um, put into like a a big uh bundle uh, and uh the like this licensing company will be like pay us x dollars and you can have all of these videos yeah yeah and so it's been you know like i still get people messaging me i think even like not even uh, not even a year ago mikey uh, mikey newman from film joy was visiting someone in florida and was like texted me was like yo we are at a bar and there is a show on tv and is this you and <laughs> and it was it was it was the nunchuck jazz I, I find it so funny because when i watch that of course i have the context of being there when it was filmed right yeah. but when i watch that i'm like no that's so obviously fake it's so right? obviously like, fake it's like nobody would do that like it, you you directly swing at yourself right yeah. like yeah <laughs> it was our third take yeah <laughs> It, and at one point we 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 stopped because police drove by. Yeah, I think we're like, I remember that. Nothing going on here. No nunchucks. Nothing here, nope. sir. <laughs> yeah, just being stupid with nunchucks. All right, yeah. carry on. Fake I, ones because real ones. Right, because they they were like legal. foam nunchucks. Foam nunchucks. Too, yeah. yeah, I mean, they still would have hurt if you whip yourself of course, in the nards with heavy, them. But yeah. I was wearing a cup. Uh, I did try to. I tried to make it look like it was f- theoretically feasible that that. Yeah. Just like the direction that I was holding them, if I released. It yeah. from my arm that it would like whip round, but I did quite it, it, not badly, but I did actually injure myself on that on the third take uh, because I hit my elbow on the ground because you fell. Mm. Right. Yeah, because I fell because the whole the whole thing this was like it was calculated. It was like the best fail videos mm. are the ones where there's a another level. Yeah, right. And so it was like hit self in nuts, fall over, ha ha ha, fall over on skateboard. And then better. what sometimes got cut off in some of these other ones is Morgan running up and kicking you. I keep going, all right? Oh, fuck. Oh! Oh! <laughs> right, Morgan, yeah. ran, Morgan ran in and <laughs> the, k- kicked the, me in the balls again. Yeah, the also the, like, yeah, helpful friend. <laughs> the jackass like, style, yeah. you know. It's, yeah, you have, you, have, you have no friends here. <laughs> but, I, I do like, and, and Tim in those things is just like, well, you know... Theoretically, you're you're ready to do the yeah. nunchuck Joe's thing as well. I got my skateboard. I'm you like, got your go. skateboard. You got your nunchucks, and then the other guy oh. just totally biffs. That's my favorite part about it. Actually, is that Tim is he's he's ready to go. All right, nunchuck jousting. Yeah. Oh. It's like we have all this set up, right? It's like the implication is that these people have done this but never tried it i guess and i don't know i i I love that the guy behind the camera which is matt is you know losing it like his laughter i think really really helps it helps sell a bunch of that yes (laughs) (laughs) but yeah that tim who is also finds it funny that i hit myself in the balls but is still like but i wanted to do the dunk check just (laughs) (laughs) that was again for context if you're unaware that was there was an episode of of Commodore Hustle where we were like, we're going to go viral. We're going to make a viral video. And so everyone has their own ideas mm-hmm. of what that entails. Are you suggesting that we do fake viral videos? That's like lying to the internet. I love it. And so everyone goes off to do their own versions of what they think a viral yeah. video ought to be. And it's really impressive. Like two of them took off really because the things on my head thing was Paul's, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the only other one I remember, but like... <laughs> 
Yeah, like, I think so. You, you, for uh, even one of them to succeed, right? Was, yeah, like you had a lot of subscribers for things on my head. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I kept that going for quite a while, just sort yeah. of mostly out of interest. And, <laughs> yeah, like, like, will people keep, keep like, watching this? <laughs> yeah, apparently they people will. like this. People, people seem to like it. Yeah, you should, you should uh, set up a Patreon. <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, everyone had their own various things. And then the, the, the idea was, because we very mistakenly were trying to do like a narrative arc show where we didn't know what was going to happen in the next episode. Um, upon reflection, uh, there were some planning issues that maybe we could have handled better for around the first season of Hustle. But I digress. The intent for that was that we would do this episode with all of our viral videos and then legitimately release them. And then in like a month or so, whatever happened in the next episode would, you know, we would incorporate whatever actually happened into the thing. And then what ended up happening is that uh, they played the clip of the nunchuck jousting on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Mm. Take a look. Nunchuck jousting. Ow. (laughs) Jousting. Yeah. Oh. Well, I finished crunching the numbers on Operation Viral Outbreak. Oh yeah? Who's in the lead? As you might expect, my testicles are winning. Uh, or losing, as the case may be. That's okay. Even if your testicles lose, we all win. Wasn't that the tagline to AVP? Nunchucks versus testicles. Whoever loses, we win. Sounds more like a fetish porn reimagining of Naruto. This is, you know, the absolute dregs of late night content where it's just we're literally just going to play funny videos from the Internet. Yeah. Um, Most of them have moved away from that. Yeah. Well, mostly I I think I think, yeah, that's not uh, there was a time. Yeah. When that wasn't content that you could just get in. You know, you have you watch the late night show in order to and you might there might be clips that you hadn't seen before. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. And so there, it was like, uh, I can't remember exactly what they called it, but it was like internet success or failure or something. Yeah, you had to and, guess, is this one going to work or not? Right? Yeah, and so they, well, it, for ours, they showed someone doing just amazing stuff with nunchucks, flipping them around, doing like just some incredible Bruce Lee level nonsense. And then it was like, and then there's this guy. And then it was yeah. me whipping myself. And, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone had a good laugh. It has also been shown on The Tonight Show under Colbert's tenure. I don't recall the context, really? but someone told me it was. The, the, the Tonight Show doesn't pay, <laughs> just to be clear. They did email they, and yeah, ask the first you, right? time. Yeah. Under Leno, they emailed and asked, and I said, cool, do you pay us for this? And they went, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, then, okay, use it, because it was funnier to me. <laughs> yeah, it was much funnier to me, that, especially for Good for Hustle, to get it on, yeah. the, on actual TV. Um, and then I assume it's just in their archive, and then... Whatever they yeah. used it eventually on the Colbert thing when it was a slow news week. I guess I don't. Again, I don't recall exactly the context for it, but that was that was funny. Did you have a distinct viral one, or were you was you were, no. were you in the nunchuck one? Yeah, that was well, just, and that I was think I bit. I think I wasn't. That was like the crew members each had their own right, and I wasn't one. Right, because so. you right you were not in in yeah, storyline. You were not I part was of the crew. Servant of the nemesis kind of thing. Right, right, role, right. right of so. course. Okay. For now, in the in the present times, in the current time where we are uh what uh, where can where can people find you i guess if you should you wish to be found <laughs> well i'm easy to find because my last name is so recognizable it is i was every now and then so it's interesting because in esports people you know every now and then people who find me from the, my content or like my footprint in esports one way or another will have known me from loading ready run or we'll like make the connection afterwards, like oh those you know the big like MTG guys, like mm-hmm. and I'm like yeah I used to be part of that, yeah. And they'll make that connection, and it's kind of interesting to see. But you know I would say hey I'm very Googleable, <laughs> you can you can find my last name and find all kinds of stuff about me. And every now and then I'm like you know in my let's say school life with other parents at school or stuff like that. I'm like I don't know how much I want to open up <laughs> because <laughs> you can find videos of me sitting on a yeah I was the one on the toilet I think in the toilet paper sommelier one. Pro? Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. So I'm sitting there with yeah. my underwear pulled up really high so that it looks like I don't have any on. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't know how we, much I want people to find that. <laughs> I mean, right we now. can't we can't run for office. You might you might be able to get away with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although the the Overton window of what's acceptable for someone to run for office know, has right? shifted so far that it's I true. think basically everything I've done is defensible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I am 
at Tim Seven Husen on Twitter. And you know, while I was I, I was working for about a year and a half recently for uh, an a esports team called Hundred Thieves. While I was doing that, I was very quiet on the content front. Um, I'm not working with them anymore, so I've been doing a little bit more on some content, doing some some Valorant coverage and statistics like that. So. Right. And I have a, a Discord server attached to my to my website, so people can hang out there if they like esports or gaming in general. Just want to talk. So sweet. That was Oracle's Luxor. If people forgot the name, so you still do fifty word stories. I do still run fifty word stories. No way. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know if it's a good time for a little more story time. Yeah. But, so I, I that's you you did a lot of that. Yeah. So because it was way back, I think James is the one who started it with the, the photo a day, mm. three three hundred sixty five photos you know, across a year. And I'm like, well, I'm not a photographer, but there's this trend. I kind of like it. And so I wrote uh, a story that is exactly 50 words long every day for a year. And then I did it two more times. And then I'm like, okay, I'm out of ideas, but I started publishing everybody else's that sent them in. And actually, I think I, cause I had gotten guest submissions a few times before. And I actually asked most of you guys, I think once, yeah. or, once or twice, you guys came up with some and sent them in. I used them. Um, and so at this point I published two stories a day on every weekday. Um, wow throughout the year so there there are thousands of stories on the website at this point there's but so many wow. i just do it you know sometimes i forget until 11 p.m and then i'm like oh i gotta do 50 stories run down and look through the email inbox and pick a couple that are good so but i'd yet do it every day pick the best one every week pick the best one every month best one every year and that's kind of so keep cool. it rolling yeah it's really fun and there's like it's fascinating because the community that is built up around it it's not a huge audience i think i think there's like a thousand people a day that read the stories which is you know it's yeah. it's something um but the comments underneath the stories are always super positive mm. and i just think back to you know back in the day when youtube was first starting for yeah. example that was like oh internet comments the worst place on the internet mm -hmm. youtube comments never looked there it's, i'm like i've i've cracked it i don't know how it's yeah. I've cracked it <laughs> it's fun when you can kind of yeah you can find that little sort of yeah. uh uh space and community yeah. where everyone is actually it's like oh we can actually have nice things yeah. sometimes if they didn't like the story <laughs> they don't say anything and when they do they're like oh this is a good i love your use of imagery like that, that one hit really hard whatever and i'm like wow this is really cool so yeah i just run that out the side of my brain kind of <laughs> forget so awesome. about it sometimes and then but I always take care of it so sweet all right well hey check out 50 word stories is it just is it still just 50 is it five zero word stories no it's it's all written out 50 word but okay. i don't think there's really anywhere else on the internet doing it very much so not hard to find just search for seven Husen. like you said that it's too. very googleable mm -hmm. seven houses did we ever work that out in dutch it is seven houses yeah okay cool <laughs> thinks he's so great with his seven houses <laughs> <laughs> just the one but you know all right well hey uh this has been a blast it's been a super fun catching up with you tim yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you for driving down. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's my pleasure. It's a nice drive. And nice. I love the moon base. You yeah. set up very well. I mean, you've, you've experienced lesser moon basin than this. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it. Uh, yeah, but until the next episode, um, I guess a reminder that everything we do is brought to you by you and your kind of support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. But more importantly, uh, I have been Graham with Paul and James on Tech and joined by Tim Sevenhusen. Thank you so much. And we will talk to you all next episode. Bye. Hey, Matt, I hope you like B-roll. <clears throat> Do I have stuff in my teeth? Uh, it's, uh, it's small. I don't think it would come across on camera, but between the your, on your left, the front and the next tooth. Like there? Uh, no, nope. next one, there. I see. No, nope. didn't. Yeah, it's right there. You didn't get it. This is great content. Hey again, back in the other room. That was nice catching up with Tim. Oh yeah, that yeah. was a lot of fun. Um, we thought that we would also uh, add because we were only talking to Tim in this episode, and we've got two people per rest of the episode. We thought we'd come back over here. Um, so surprise, I don't remember what kind of sign off we did. <laughs> surprise to talk about um, some other folks because uh, we've got two guests per episode for this podcast, one in this case. Uh, and that covers a bunch of people, but a relatively small percentage of the number of like everyone who's ever been involved or been in a video or helped out some way behind the scenes over the years. I mean, it, there's a lot of those people. Yeah. And, and both because obviously there's just too many people for us to get everybody in. And also because 
some of the people uh, can't be uh, uh, can't join us for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah, M- largely speaking, it's just the practicality of of talking to all these people in the time that we have for these for these episodes. Um, but yeah, so we we thought we'd we'd take some time now and just quickly. <laughs> air quotes i don't know how long we're gonna be here for let's find out together uh talk about some of the other folks that have been around over the years that have helped in some way that we did want to just particularly mention and highlight especially if we didn't get a chance to like really talk about their contributions in another episode Mm -hmm. of this podcast either one that you have already heard or one that is yet to be released so let's begin at the beginning of loading ready run where it was just it was us and the other folks that were around mm-hmm. and um sort of the the big we, t- we talked about the the coalescing of uh the crew in the fringe show right which is a bunch of folks that you either have seen or will be seeing uh, through this struck from behind by my 1987 view of the saber <laughs> Poor Billy. and some other folks um specifically uh, i mean i think and their names are always spoken almost as a, almost as a unit, but Bill and Morgan, mm-hmm. right? It also, it sounds weird to say Morgan and Bill as it well. It does. I don't know why it was, I mean, Bill was the, was the, the nexus as we've, as we've joked in a, you know, in a few episodes, right? So there was, there was that. It's like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It sounds better up front. Yeah. Bill and Morgan. It works better with the, the single syllable name mm. up front. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we spoke with, uh, in the episode with James and, and, and some other folks about sort of, you know, like hanging out of Bill's place. I mean, that's kind of how I, for the first 10 years we measured time was yeah. like at what, where in, where in the city did Bill live? Because wherever Bill lived, that's where we would be. Yeah. And that's how it's always been. But, um, Bill, it's hard not to make a joke. Bill was a big contributor. Uh, no, <laughs> he was physically large. Actually, brief aside, I find this very funny because uh, Bill was, you know, six foot ten, mm. six, creeping up on six eleven. He liked to say six nine because it was funny. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's really tall, and that skewed people's perceptions on video. For a long time. Of yeah. everyone else. Because they were sort of like, it's whenever people would meet us in person, they'd go. Wow, you're much taller in real life. Because they would see Bill and assume, oh, he's the tall guy. So he's like 6'3". And then there's like myself or someone like Ian or whatever. And they're like, okay, so they're like. 5'10", and then they assume that like Paul or Matt Wiggins yeah, are yeah. like, I don't know, like five foot four. I don't know how tall they assumed that you must have been. And it's like, no, 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 he's huge. I'm 6'3". Paul is, as we've said before, the average height of an adult human in North America. Yeah, for uh, for the for a long time, uh, I was like the shortest person in Loading Ready Run. Yeah. Or Matt and I, I think we're the same, yeah. or something like that. And we're not short people either. It was just, it was, you know, the bell curve was all messed up. Cause if you, if you look on camera, um, Bill and Morgan both were heavily involved in the early years of loading ready run and, uh, you know, contributing a lot to the writing and, uh, certainly like the, you know, like the initial like brainstorming and idea stuff, you know, there was a lot of their, a lot of their humor in the, in the earlier seasons. Mm-hmm. Eventually they both sort of, as a unit, I remember that this discussion happened on the same day with both of them sort of as a united front when they were like, we, we, we don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and we were like, okay, that's fine. Like yep. it was not, you know, it was a, we were all still friends afterwards and hung out all the time still. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, they were like, we've decided that we would rather do other things with our Saturdays. And uh, I just, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you, you know, producing a video, Especially, you know, at the time, this was when we were still producing a video every week. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's that's all you do with your spare time, basically. Yeah. That's, that's you've sort of committed to that as being what you're doing with your spare time. So yeah, and it was like, that was... That's that not was for, yeah, it's not necessarily for everybody. Yeah, that was our Saturdays. That was everyone's Saturday every time. And, you know, we'd go to like, we'd film something and then we'd all go to a restaurant. And we'd, <laughs> you'd get like nine or ten people sitting around a big table everyone's on their phones mm. 
because and it looked like we hated each other but the fact is we just had a full day of like goofing around with each other and spending time together doing funny right. creative things right. and making each other laugh and this is the wind down where we're like i'm just gonna be quiet until the food gets here because mm. i don't have enough brain power to like carry on sparkling conversation with my friends whose company i do enjoy but i don't look like it right now <laughs> So yeah, they, uh, they, they, they both, uh, step, I don't recall the exact timeline, but they both decided to step away. Uh, and we're still involved is the thing. Like cert I mean, certainly they were involved with desert bus for many years after that for, right. you know, as long as they were, uh, able. And I mean, even in like sketches and things, they were, uh, in coming back for stuff i mean we had we had morgan reprising both ice tray and kilobyte in a final battle to the death in the loading ready rumble 2 the final sketch right my exalted greatness i don't bite no one i'm tesla you're edison yeah i'm rich and famous and you died a virgin also i kill elephants metaphorically and in one case literally that's not okay elephants be an ecologically vulnerable species this is a throwdown. Morgan was sort of the the impetus for um, the the whatever thing. And hey, and welcome to whatever. A New York man drank an energy drink called Boost Plus. It gave him quote an erection that would not subside. Of all his options at that point, he decided to sue the makers of it. Yeah, stuff like that, which. Um, think we have talked about we have or will talk about that yeah the, the the you know the jump cut video blog so yeah he started the whatever thing and then sort of went off it a bit yeah. and then i carried that on and it sort of morphed through to fail house and feed up and all things. that stuff. yeah yeah, yeah. They, they were certainly always game for it too which is good uh morgan especially was you know it's like do you want me to take my pants off <laughs> i will do that and like i but don't i i actually not, really yeah, don't but thank you for asking part of the script yeah um We've, we've, we've drifted apart. I don't keep in regular contact uh, mm. with Morgan these days, um, but I know that he he seems very happy and he has a partner and a child and he's, he's, he's living life. So awesome. Bill, uh, of course, uh, very sadly, as I know most of you know, but if you don't, um, he was diagnosed with Huntington's, uh, which is a hereditary degenerative illness he didn't know for sure he didn't get the diagnosis until after he left and uh like i said he kept coming back for desert bus uh for many years even while like actively dealing with this mm. uh until eventually it got to a point where it just didn't even work for him to come in and hang out even with uh even with kate watt his mom hanging around and sort of you know helping support him and then and you know Many years ago now, he unfortunately passed away because that's what Huntington's does. And yeah. it sucks. Um, but we do get to make hilarious jokes at his expense because he's not here to hit us for it. <laughs> that, that's the best part is that Bill was, and I've said this before, and we love him, such an asshole that uh, we can make jokes uh, jokes about him. And then immediately we can all go, he would have liked that because mm -hmm. that was mean spirited. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss him. I think this might have been. I don't know if this actually made it into. Was actually in a video. Um, I think it 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 was. It might have been like in a behind the scenes thing or something. But um, we it was on Canada Day. Um, here here in Victoria, and we all went down to the Inner Harbor, and Canada Day, at the time anyway, at the Inner Harbor. Uh, you know, it was just packed with people. Mm -hmm. Just you know, drunk people as far as the eye can see. Um, and these two these two guys started getting into it. Yeah. Uh, and started, you know, the way drunk people fight, which is like a lot of posturing before they actually do anything. Yeah. Right? I believe they did physically encounter one another. Yeah. But yeah. And, and uh, sort of a hole in the crowd starts opening up around them as yeah. people don't want to get involved, but are also kind of curious. And uh, Bill... <laughs> Oh, Canada dude, can a man break that up? Canada yeah. man is not about to break up anything. Uh oh, looks like Bill's gonna try shit. That's not Just walks right into the center of this fight and starts singing "Oh Canada," 
And it's really hard to keep up like a head of steam to get into like a fight with somebody when a six foot ten guy is standing in front of you singing O Canada. This is one of my favorite memories. And uh, it was just it was an amazing thing to sort of watch him defuse the situation completely. Yeah. And the two guys kind of <laughs> like rumbled you, and walked off. You can't it's such a it's it's it, it it's such a jarring sight that you weren't prepared for that you can't be you can't stay angry. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, why is he saying okay? I guess it's Canada Day. I guess okay, we should not we should not fight. <laughs> okay. You're right, you're right, giant ginger man. But yeah, he was always great in the crowd because you could see Everyone was like, hey, go meet at Bill. Yeah, that was useful for early day of the PAX. Yeah, yeah. that was handy. Yeah, yeah, Other contributors to that fringe show, because right. there were another couple folks, um, Ash, of course, Ash Vickers, who not only did some comics for us in the early years, but appeared in a lot of early sketches. Third wheel dating has been amazing for our relationship. I appreciate Peter so much more now that I know what some of my alternatives are. For me, the best part is knowing that even if your partner is kind of a bitchy ice queen, you could be doing so much worse. And I'd take adequate four playlist sex with you over what Dan could offer me any day. You guys got any Mountain Dew? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was in one scene in the in the Fringe show because we were like, we need we need we need a woman, and she has to actually be attractive, so it can't be one of us in a in a dress. <laughs> uh, or the bit the joke doesn't work if she's not hot. You know. Uh, Three large pizzas seems like an awful lot for a woman like yourself. I'm hungry. You sure you don't want any help with them? If you're offering, come on in. Now that she had what she wanted, she took me inside and showed me the best time I could have asked for. I never imagined it would be so good. It was warm. It was soft. It was covered in cheese. <laughs> the wonder of deep dish sin. You know, this is good pizza. I've had better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we she was like the femme fatale for indeed. like a thirty minutes or less thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was uh, that. That was great. And yeah, Ash has been appearing and stuff over the years, and obviously was involved with Desert Bus for many years as well. Yeah, so he says, I remote into that computer from places around ca campus to access my files and run all the software, which manages all of our stuff. I just connected from an instructor station in a lecture hall and it automatically switched to the audio device and suddenly Desert Bus was playing over the entire auditorium sound system. It was a very loud caffeine, <laughs> presumably talking about no donor accounts. <laughs> <laughs> and also hidden backstage was Tally, right. uh, Jared's partner, this is before they were married. Tally was helping us with like makeup. And because we were like, oh, it's the stage. We need Which to. Most of us had like never wear, worn any kind of stage makeup. Before. Well, like maybe like a little bit of stage stuff. Yeah. At like high school. But yeah. So it was like, hey, you don't really know my friends very well, but do you want to hide in a dark corner backstage and see all of them in their underwear as they frantically change costumes backstage? And Tally also, I mean, um, apart from making Harry the giant creepy doll, mm -hmm. uh, who's still around. <laughs> And I think I think recently she re repacked him. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, he needed it. <laughs> I decided to make him anyway. Do you still want him? Oh, for sure. Also, you know, in a lot of our uh, when we were doing our own like fulfillment uh, of merchandise, was helping like pack and ship T-shirts and stuff. Ashley was helping out with that as well uh, a lot. We we mentioned um, Ashley in the episode talking to James with the the first sketch that she was in. Hi, I've got a one-ton shipment of soiled panties. Sign here, please. Tell her I'm not here. And but, uh, uh, it was a it was an all hands on deck affair when we were fulfilling a pre order, and I'm it was it, it there was, was there was a certain amount of camaraderie. You know, it was like, hey, this is a thing that we're all doing together, and isn't that neat? And I'm really glad that we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> the worst thing that could possibly happen is that the part of 
angry iguanas came through and set fire to the entire building, burned all the t-shirts. That would be the worst thing that could happen. That's I don't know. Yeah. That happened once. It took a long time to recover. Tally, I'll do you one worse. Just a comment right on the office. <laughs> Tally also uh, wrote and wrote at least, I think, I can think of at least two sketches that she wrote. There was a scribble, the scribble knots one. Oh yeah, the scribble knots video. And there was a yoga one that she wrote as well. I do remember the yoga video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the halo pose. Like, like this. Uh, just about. You need to cradle the assault rifle here. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of this, you're new, and really feel the heft of the weapon right through here. She, of course, uh, uh, appeared in a number of, uh, number of videos. I was talking about being more environmentally friendly, you know, recycle, conserve energy, bike to work. And I believe she also made the original costumes for Krog and Torg. What wrong, Krog? Krog unhappy. Frame rate too low. What is frame rate? How fast pictures move. Ah, uh, Krog, this picture not moving. Me no. Current frame rate is one. One what? Just one. Yeah, 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 which we still use. Yeah. Yeah, we've misplaced some of the feet, but yeah. Me hope to overclock frame rate to two, but need to find more paint first. She's also uh, credited as co-writing Magic Land, because I think she came up with a jingle for the, the like, Littlest Warriors, which right. he also did the, the Amagama Rumis or whatever they're called. Hello, boys and girls. Today we are going to learn how to pillage a village. Let's all say that together. Pillage a village. Now you say it. What are we going to do today? That's right. The, the, the manner in which they are done with yarn, I can't say if it's crocheted or cross stitched because I'll get it wrong. Oh, right, right, yeah. Because <laughs> so, I always get it wrong. Uh, and when we did our uh, when we did our Kickstarter, actually. Oh, all, all the little creepy dolls. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we had a, a extremely limited run because we did Tally was making them by hand. Yeah. And she was like, make it a very limited run. We're yep. like, yes, I think 50 yeah, is I think what so. we did. Uh, and so she made those as well. So anyway. Anyway, uh, gosh, there's so many people. Andy. Right. Good old Andy. F fan f fan favorite, Andy Cowden. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, knew him from high school. Um, he was always We're, just, he. We, we always like to, it's like Andy is like an act an actual actor yeah as opposed to the rest of us he's been on the tv <laughs> we knew him before that though what was that what was that show called eureka eureka that was it, it. was like an absent-minded professor kind yeah. of type uh and he did a he did voice on the um the ratchet and clank movie yep um uh, before you start in with the um questioning it's important you understand that i'm faithful to my employer and that's how I found out I was lactose intolerant. Though I think the parakeet would have died anyway because he was always flying into the window. Uh, a he did a number of voices in the recent Asterix and Obelix movies. Mm -hmm. Hear me, old traveler. Hear my words for wandering souls. Hear me and my message, old traveler. Or not, whether you be a traveler or rather some other person journey. What are you ramping on about? At one yeah. point he talks to himself, I think. <laughs> yeah, and if you're around Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, chances are you have seen him or have the opportunity to see him in various stage productions. Does yeah, I think he's done like Bart on the Beach a bunch of times and different things like that. Yeah. I mean, it's a you know, a tough gig to be a working actor these days, but uh, he uh, he's done some really good. And of course, he's been in a lot of our stuff. Yeah, I love that sometimes in the early years, a whole weekly sketch was just like, uh, here's Andy being Andy. My name's inconsequential, and as strange as that may be, my name's too differential from the others you may see. For when it was time to name me, it was up to dear old dad. So he gave me every name my patrilineage ever had. Mm. saves us work for a week yeah you know it's like here's a song he wrote or here's him doing some performing or whatever you know i think um uh i think his most enduring thing might be uh tucson or bust the heat is beating down like lava i 
can't believe that they're still 300 miles i can tell by the dials on the dash which of right. course was at the very first desert bus it was an improvised musical called two or bus right somebody just randomly asked to yeah do that which musically is completely unrelated to the song he eventually wrote for like desert bus three three or four and we still yeah. use that mu that's like three that's like the 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 instrumental of two or bus which he composed and performed is still the music that i use when we're doing like you know like a, some sort of desert bus um promotional thing. Desert Bus promotional video because it's it's a really good piece of music you know I think my personal favorite, there's a lot of excellent performances of Andy's, obviously the Papers, Please video, uh, which is one of our highest viewed videos ever on our YouTube channel. Hello, hello, welcome, come in. This is good, sit down. No, don't sit down, it's not chair. You stand up, stand up is good. This is good, how are you? Good to see you. Glory Arstotska, why are you here? You're here for entry. Ah, it's only five look. you give us cash, no American Express. I, uh, Kidding, of course, of course. <laughs> Papers, please. Uh, that's a that's a strong one. My favorite is the the Shakespearean crap shot. Thou scurvy currish knave! I wonder much why thou wouldst make of me a telephonic Sisyphus. Thou call'st this Hades service. My working hours I have forsworn to tarry with thy damned and automated system. It helps me not, forsooth. It is a devil. With pre-recorded voice, it helps me not. With Muzak in its teeth, it helps me not. It whips me with its red tape tongue, and lo, the day wanes on, and still I gain no service. What sayest thou? How dost thou answer me, thou churish, whoreson, sodded, witted villain? Mr. Marlowe, um, that's a billing issue. I'm going to transfer you. Where he's on on the phone with customer support, mm. uh, which largely that was. I don't remember who because it's always tough to know for crap shots i don't know who exactly came up with the nugget of that concept but basically all that dialogue was andy's <laughs> mother fuck i do also want to shout out this is this is this is kind of a funny one um but related to the papers please video i want to shout out to uh a gentleman who at the time on our forums was known as alexander ditto mm. uh alexander roterer who wrote the papers please video uh which ended up being one of our most viewed videos. Welcome! Are you hungry? Here you go. Wait, what? You like the ladies? Of course you do. Take, take! They have a good salad bar. Used to be a steak bar, but with world health crisis, childhood obesity, now you use salad bar. Still good. You know, only 10 lo, all you can eat. I don't want. He also wrote a video about pocket planes, which mm. we were like, we could do this. Can we do this in a week? We can animate this in a week. This was mostly me being like, yeah, I can do this. Good evening and thank you for choosing Pocket Planes Airlines. Where our motto is, we are the only airline. Uh, and we put together this Pocket Planes video and then the people that made Pocket Planes, Nimblebit, hired us to do a bunch of shorts for uh, for Pocket Planes and Tiny Tower. Mm. Uh, attention passengers, the captain has illuminated the shut up and let him fly the darn plane sign. Thank you for your cooperation. You are so lucky I'm not bees. Ah! Uh, hey guys. Do you have a sushi place here? Ah! The floor 37! Ah! And then came back to us years later when they're like, hey, it's the 10th anniversary of Tiny Tower. Can, can, can we get you to do a, like a, another thing again? Uh, and that was because of this thing that, that he wrote. It's really funny. He wrote three sketches for us. We have a logo? Jesus Christ. The third one was also fine, but these two, <laughs> <laughs> these two weirdly just, they landed in, yeah, a, in a big way. I mean, two out of three sketches really taking off um, uh, is not a bad track record. Yeah. Wait, I, I should have said at the top of the show, we are going to miss people. Like yeah. there are, if you go to the, the page on our wiki uh, for people, <laughs> not the crew, but there's, there's a page just called people and it lists basically everyone that the wiki 
is like a, is aware of. It's like anybody who's ever been credited in a video. Yeah, anyone to 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 crib a joke from the Mystery Science Theater movie. You know, people who just walked by the set while we were filming, like that level of of granularity there. But you know, you, you look at like uh, Chris and Tippy who were in some of the videos in the first season. Uh, ben Wilkinson, who was in a bunch of videos over the years, most notably as Derek from the Warriors of Darkness. Mm. Brad. Hey, Rob, I'm going to the pub. So I'll see you. Oh, sweet. Can I come too? I don't know. You like the pub? Well, sure. Why would I like the pub? Wow. Uh, our friend Laura, I don't even know what Laura's up to these days, I think. Moved to Toronto, possibly moved back. She was in a couple sketches. I shot a independent film for her once. Look, guys, you weren't invited. I thought I made it pretty clear at the Portable Ops and the Acid 2 auditions. We just don't want you. You just don't fit into the image that we're trying to create. There's also, of course, some of the more behind the scenes folks um, mm. responsible for our the music. Yeah. Um, the great Bradley Rains, mm -hmm. who, who did a ton of our music. Once we, after the first season, when we were, we were like, we probably shouldn't use uh, just copyright music anymore. Yeah. Because that's awkward. Yeah. We then moved, as I think, probably, I don't know if this happens still, but at least at the time, the next step from just straight up cop, you know, using real music, using copyright music would be to use Apple loops. And we used Apple Loops for a while. Sure which were, did. I don't know. Do people still use Apple Loops? Their GarageBand the, was a program that came with uh, Mac computers, mm -hmm. uh, and built into it there were. Uh, it was. I don't. I think it was innovative in the sense that it was easier to use than other programs. Yeah. Not innovative in the sense of inventing the concept of loops. No, but, but it came with like 200 something. They were know. really high quality and looped nicely and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so for a while, everybody was using it. It was funny because like you would you would hear recurring th themes. You'd be like, hey, they took our music. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, that's just the loop. So we used that for a while. And then uh, we, we, you know, we, we did a lot. Of, and you'll see like a lot of season two videos and season three, two probably. Um, and then didn't Bradley email you and say like your music sucks? Yeah, he sent me, uh, <laughs> I think we told the story at like the 10 year at like Lurcon, I think it was, but yeah, he sent me an email. Uh, basically I think, I think in his words, he might've had a little to drink mm. and, uh, sent a, you know, an emotionally charged email, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to make it succinct. I, I I think his general mess it went went on for some pages, uh, it, but the general message was your music sucks. Fuck you, pay me. Uh, right, <laughs> I'll do it. And it was sort of like, whoa, hey there. And then we had it. I fondly remember this phone call because I got a phone call from a number I did not recognize, and this voice on the other end, s sounding beyond his years, uh, was this like, hey there. And I was like, hi, who is this? And I just remember, it's Brad Lorraine's, man. And I was like, well, that's not I, how I thought you would sound. How did he, how did he get your number? I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe I gave it to him. I can't remember. Um, he, he has appeared in one video. So I just wanted to know, like, where do you guys get your ideas from? Which was the... What, X ways to Y that we shot part of at Lurcon. Oh, right. Because he, he, he was there. So we had him be the person in the Q&A line asking the question about the like, like, where do you get your ideas? Right, right. Because we thought that'd be, especially as a creative, where you get your ideas is like the worst question. So we <laughs> thought it'd be really funny for, you know, Bradley especially to do that. But yeah, Bradley did a bunch of, a bunch of music that we still use. I'm sure he's annoyed that we still use it, but not, not like, not like in a like litigious way, just sort of, you know, like that we haven't found new stuff, but it's like, you know, like the checkpoint theme, mm. right? Excellent stuff. The music for Quirpline, the interstitial 
stings and bumpers for Commodore Hustle and Friday Nights. Yeah. Uh, you know, all some of which he made for that pilot that we did once. Uh, you know, all that stuff. The the Friday Nights remix of the Commodore Hustle music because the Commodore Hustle music originally is a is a loop from yeah, like yeah. the Commodore sixty four thing. Um, the uh, Sim did he did the same thing with the feed dump intro as well. He did the feed dump title theme based on a on a um, on a Commodore sixty four loop. So yeah, a lot of stuff. His 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 music casts a long shadow. There was a tier on the Kickstarter, the the year of Lur Kickstarter, to get the you know a curated soundtrack. Actually, he did full soundtracks as well for Tabletop Deathmatch for both seasons and for Strip Search. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Lots of stuff. So he eventually realized that, and I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, that uh, music was actually not his passion. Music might have been his family's passion, but it, and he was very good at it, but it was not necessarily his passion. And so he moved on to other creative pursuits. And, I, and that's, that's when he stopped doing music for us, not because we had any falling out, just because he was like, I'm actually not making music anymore. We share a love of Top Gear, and I did ask him when we did Road Quest. I was like, hey, do you want to, you know, mm -hmm. get back in the saddle for this? And he's like, "I hey, thank you for asking me. That's awesome, but no. And so we we went, speaking of music, we asked uh, Jimmy Hinson, uh, yeah. Big Giant Circles, who had done stuff for us for years, for free, for fun, as the Desert Bus remixes. There's three or four of them. Right. That he did for us over the years of Desert Bus, just sort of like remixing the Loading Ready Run theme. They they play when we go live on, on Twitch sometimes. They're in, that's all Big Giant Circles music, so they're in that loop. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's like the rock remix and the dub remix and stuff. One of them is the backing track that we use for the, the highlights or when I'm doing a YouTube update or something. And so, yeah, Jimmy did the amazing soundtrack for Road Quest, which still just absolutely kills. Big fan. When you're talking behind the scenes stuff, this, you know, in uh, not this episode maybe a future episode we will have talked about russ mm. we, we will be talking about russ uh pitts from the escapist and how critical he was to loading ready run taking unskippable on board at the escapist you can do this yeah just listen to scooby you can do it Verona. in a similar vein uh want to shout out to mike robles you you may not know who that is at the time he was community manager for Magic at Wizards of the Coast in the early days of having a community manager. I don't envy him having this job at this time. He's since moved on to doing community stuff for um, Microsoft and Turtle Rocket, lots of other places. But um, at the time, he was at, at Wizards. And w when we did the It's Magic episode of Commodore Hustle, uh, he got a hold of us and was like, hey, this is great. We've been watching it at the office. This is really cool. Uh, and sent us a, a I, think we I think we told this story, but he sent us a box of stuff. He's of like some swag or whatever that got lost in the mail. <laughs> and it's so awkward to be like, um, that free box of very free stuff that you did not have to send us, we don't seem to have received. It worked out. Uh, but he was able to get us a meeting with the, you know, the, the stakeholders, I suppose you'd call them, uh, at PAX East where we pitched Friday nights. And so that was a, another huge sort of. Yeah. And, and having, Rubicon. you know, having somebody sort of being a, your champion within the company mm -hmm. is so valuable for that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, especially, you know, when, as, as you were saying, the, the, you know, the sort of community outreach aspect of uh, Watsi was still sort of getting off the ground and they didn't really know, like, what it would be. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of got in there and we're like, hey, maybe it could be this. Maybe it could be this video. And they're like, okay, cool, let's do that. Yeah, and then I guess the, the yeah, the third person who's sort of outside of, of Loading Ready Run who really... Um, got us going on stuff was uh robert Koo. yeah because he'd been of course aware of us for years and working with us for years f through desert bus and just through you know we we did stuff with at pax and did panels and stuff yeah and he'd been very 
personally and privately supportive of Desert Bus as well. Like obviously Child's Play and Penny Arcade supported us on stuff, but like Robert personally also was very supportive in ways that were not really publicized. Uh, and, you know, we've always been super appreciative for that. One that I can tell, this is, I love this. Uh, I don't remember which Desert Bus this was, James, maybe you remember. Uh, it was so hot. It was brutal. It was just, a, it was n the venue did not have good ventilation. And he was like, hey, this sucks. And just went out and came back with two Dyson air blades and was like, there. And we're like, oh, cool, thanks. He's like, these are yours now. <laughs> I don't want to take them home. They keep these. Uh, we still, one of them like eventually blew its whatever, but because some of the air blades are not amazing, but one of them was still using it <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> years later. Uh, and then, yeah, when we did, you know, PATV, bringing Checkpoint on board, doing strip search, uh, you know, all that stuff, that was also another sort of really important, like, someone who liked what we were doing and had the platform to help us out and lift us up. Yeah. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. There's a visual identity that we have through some of our products that is all the fault. <laughs> it all comes down to featherweight mm. Devin, who we've talked before about how like Tim, for example, we talked earlier this episode about how Tim was like, Hey, no one's doing behind the scenes stuff for you can i do that and just sort of showed up and started doing it featherweight was like hey <laughs> I, the the niche he identified was hey no one's doing a comic where they take funny things that you say out of hand and serializing it into a four panel comic strip <laughs> i've started doing that <laughs> right so he this was years which is, after which is called stolen jokes stolen jokes yeah. yeah this was years after we'd stopped running comics on the website he was like hey here's here's these things. And we were like, these are really funny. Like they were obviously well drawn and they were really funny. And they were, it was almost like, like, uh, you know, stream highlights before stream highlights. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so we eventually were like, all right, let's put these on the website. These are really good. So we started putting them on the website and he would submit them. It was like every two weeks or something he would, he would do like a little thing. And then it got more involved that we were like, oh, we need a, we need art for this thing. Oh, Hey, you know who we should ask? And then featherweight, you know, now he's like, He's on our internal Slack and it's just like, hey, shoot, we need this thing. Featherweight, can you do it? So, you know, like all the, this was super useful during the pandemic when we moved to doing the, the podcasts with, that were all remote and the webcams were bad and it was all out of sync. So they were like tightly edited and had the cartoon. Right. So yeah, floppies. all the, uh, you know, yeah, all the art for, um, for, yeah, for those, those podcasts, mm -hmm. like uh punt counter punt on, um, uh, on, on the PPRs, PPRs. yeah. Um, a, a lot of the character art for Dice Friends yep. shows. Lots of the care and in different styles too, which is which is great. I mean, there's a there's a style that is sort of like the the loading ready run like house style, I guess. Which again is all featherweight mm. uh, for stuff like the podcasts and punt counter punt and you know various other projects like that but then you know there's he's done a lot of different styles of things for various dice friends art over the years and uh all uh, the all the corp line art he does all the corp line art um i was gonna say actually dice friends all the way back to lava bears that was the first i think that might have been one of the first things where it was really like this is a big project right we're sort of bringing you on for this because it was like jared would send the audio off to featherweight before he'd even been editing it and featherweight would like Jerry would nominate a couple moments, but also it's anything that Featherweight found inspiring. He would just, he would do the art for that. Uh, then yeah, everything for Quirpline, all the sponsor notes, all the, the reason that goats are such a thing as that wasn't a thing we nominated. The whole reason I've said this before, the whole reason Tugger Nuts is a goat is because Featherweight felt like it. We recorded that whole bit and we're like, here's the thing. And here's the list of all the, the things. At no point did we ever say Tugger Nuts wasn't a goat, but we <laughs> certainly never asked him to do that. And then he sent these all back and he, he was not, he wasn't anthrop anthropomorphized. It's not even clear that Tugger Nuts can talk. He's just, he's a mystery solving goat. <laughs> he's just a goat. And it was the funniest thing. So yeah, uh, now like goats feature prominently in various pieces of, uh, I mean, the goat was there, the, the, like the crest, not the crest, but like the tourism logo, mm. the goat was there. Goats showed up early on, but yeah, now definitely goats are just like a, a like recurring motif in Innsberg branding, <laughs> which I, I find very, very, very funny. Uh, in, um, Seafoot. Oh, uh, 
art instructions, art instruction with Arthur instruction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's the hand and the uh, drawing to, that we cut to that goes along with Beige talking. Yeah. It's not, we frame it. Movie such magic. That, yeah. We frame so you can't see what's on the easel. And then we just, it's literally he. Be, <laughs> be, we, we just record a big thing with Beige and then Featherweight has to deal with it. Yeah. It's great. He does a great <laughs> job. But yeah, like we have the, it, it's this is a this is we're drilling down on something here but we plan without telling beach we plan and record what the phone calls are going to be and maybe he has a rough idea but generally generally he doesn't and so we just sort of throw that stuff at beach and beach improvs reacting to it and how he's going to do it but without specifying exactly what he's drawing he does sort of like okay yeah we can incorporate that i'll put that over here right and not not being very specific about what he's doing and then so that's one level of improv then we hand that to featherweight and featherweight has to draw based on whatever b just decided to say it's i i love it it's it's great so yeah we're we're still you know we get uh getting him to do the stuff for uh, punt counter punt and uh, all kinds of things yeah lots of sort of t-shirt designs and things too yeah uh, related to dice friends as well i want to obviously shout out to dale mm -hmm. who you know i think you know it's funny because i think that he was introduced at, originally as a D, D player in m sort of mid-season commodore hustle episodes arriving at the bottom you are shocked to discover you are walking on a river of gold the wealth of a thousand kingdoms spreads here before you. I take it. Wealth of a thousand kingdoms, you can't carry that much gold. Portable hole. I'm not done the box text. Right. Was that the first time he showed up on Loading Ray Run? I I think he might have popped by Desert Bus once or twice mm. and made himself known as a guy who can sing amazingly. And obviously he was one of the monks on the that ENN episode with the um the saint the saint right. pokedexias but he's he's someone we've known for years through i don't even remember how <laughs> but he's just he's been a he's been a a force of nature in the local tabletop role-playing scene for for many many years and then yeah he was introduced as one of jer's players in the episodes of commodore hustle where there was like a there was a sort of a side cast. Action point. Made it. Immune. I failed. I passed her an amulet of health. You're cured. Okay. Then the dragon breathes on you. This is an awfully long surprise round. It has pounce. That is surprising. Yeah, uh, Jared, like a D&D &D group. Yeah, Jared's uh, D&D &D group. When actual plays were becoming more of a thing, uh, we were like, hey, we should get... Yes, it was after Temple of the Lava Bears, but we were like, wait, we should get Dale to, to do something. And so, you know, he yeah, and run, I mean, run several campaigns for us. Now, there are springs that are supposed to be involved in the blade coming out, but the springs are not working properly on this. Oh, no. So I think that this knife then springs wildly <laughs> towards someone. So I think the way we're going to find out who is on the receiving end of this knife uh -huh. is you're all being given the option of leaping out of the way. The three failures oh, are helping me to know how badly this is going to affect you. And I had, I have personally played in at least two like long running home campaigns uh, with Dale as the DM. So like, I'm trying to think if I have, I played in one where Dale was a player. Right. Cause it was the, he was the, he was a, a cleric. He was a cleric of what got it. It involved drinking. Yeah. He showed up with a case of strongbow every time <laughs> that was just open season because his, and that was for the character because his cleric's god was like the, yeah. the, the god of getting wasted. I don't, I can't remember. Anyway. And so, yeah, Dale, you know, has been running, running campaigns and one shots for us for, uh, for many years at this point and still being involved with coming by for desert bus they do their D, D thing now and um sometimes we'll get him in for a for an afk and stuff like that which is great yeah, yeah. similarly jacob 
at this point, it's been years, but it feels like a f it feels fairly recent because, frankly, the pandemic has ruined my sense of time. Comparatively, comparatively recent. recent. Uh, and I think that it was through Corey through. Yeah, I think they were friends. Yeah. First. And it was sort yeah. of like, hey, you should know you should meet my friend Jacob. And I was like, all right, sure. Hi. And he seemed nice. And then this is just got suddenly he's around. Like, it's yeah, weird yeah. how that happens uh, beyond like doing stuff in uh, the panelists and always being very game for improv and stuff. And now also being very involved with Desert Bus as well. And you know, being keen to be on AFK and stuff. Nice. Gross. Also running Dice Friends. It's a party. Just have fun. Okay. That is the most Toreador advice I've heard in a long time. Specifically, not a drop to drink. The Vampire the Masquerade campaign. Right. Uh, for which I believe he also... Much loved. ...actually wrote some of the background material for the actual game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big fan of the vamps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's neat to have all these different perspectives on you know it, it's neat to, you know both um, uh, Jacob and Dale and of course Cameron and Kathleen and all the other DMs have very uh, have quite different styles, mm -hmm. but uh, you all but they all sort of end up with creating really neat games for everybody. So yeah. One other person that I wanted to mention also, because we talked about Friday nights, was of course it's 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 funny when that it's like, oh right, yeah, because it's been a few years again since we made Friday nights. Uh, but Missy was brought on board as like cast member of Friday nights. All priority. Get out of our house. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Because Missy used to co-host the local like Lady Planeswalker evenings, mm. which I think was another victim of the pandemic. You know, Missy obviously and um, her partner Dave, who run Paper Street Theater in town and have been doing improv for years. Dave himself actually appeared in a few episodes of ENN as well. Um, great to have. It's <laughs> when we get someone like Andy or Missy around whom we lovingly joke are like real actors. Right. Uh, it is. It's so nice that they they really do i think almost subconsciously uh everyone really like raises like ups their own game because it's like oh boy shit, she's taking this seriously i gotta do a really good job here the question is what kind of goblins were they w professor nobody knows that mogs w no the wrath cycle wrathy goblins were all mogs bred by the evan cars point for missy wow the story was metal <laughs> Well, of course it was. He's the silver golem. You know, I'm thinking specifically of like doctors hate her. <laughs> Missy, what happened to you? Doctors hate me. Which, mm. which I was like, no, we got to get. We, I, I want to have, I want to have Missy for this because it's like it's so focused on this one person who needs to be able to really sell, needs to be able to play this incredibly silly concept absolutely straight. And you came right here? I had to. They know where I live. They could have followed you. What, what, why would they follow me? He's here. Who is? The Surgeon General. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was good. She was also Lady Landline, the nemesis of Guy with a Cell Phone Man. Right. And uh, uh, one half of... Um, uh, oh, Savoy and Chevalier. Savoy and Chev the, Chevalier. The nemesises as well. Nemesi, nemixes. I don't remember which was which. Uh, she's Ch uh, Chevalier. Okay. Yes. I know I mean, this because of the entering the characters for the rumble. That I was going to say, part of the joke is that nobody knows which is which for either of the two teams. That <laughs> might have that might have been like entering entering the wrestler names for the loading ready for, for the autumnal rumble might have been when that was decided yeah, like for yeah. Kane and Crowthorn as well. It was like, which one's Kane, which one's Crowthorn? Ah, it doesn't matter. But it's like, no, now you need to actually, it's like we knew at one point and then it, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. The rumble itself also gets its branding. I mean, I called it the autumnal rumble, but the most recent one, thanks Geddon, 
that that subtitle. I had other worse ideas, but uh, Jen Mangled Pixel mm. suggested Thanks Geddon because Jen was doing the graphics for it. And I mean, Mangled Pixel has been doing you know motion graphics for us for years now. The 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 intros to the streams uh, when we started actually getting like proper good looking animated intros to our streams. That's Jen. <laughs> yeah, didn't Jen originally do one just like. I think this would be cool. I think so. I don't remember which one, but I think it was just like because I didn't like logos and stuff. But I, I'm not, I'm not a MoGraph person, and Jen mm. is, and so yeah, they were like, here, ha- have this, and I think I was like, ah, right. If I'm not good at something, instead of just trying to do it and producing a bad thing, I should get someone who is good at that thing because I can't be good at all the things. <laughs> hey. Could you do more of those things? Yeah, and that, but it's like, and now we've got one that looks really good yeah. and the rest don't look so good. Well, that doesn't work. Yeah. So, yeah, the, um, I mean, some of the, I think some of the podcast intros might have been originally done by someone else, but I think, I think they, in their refreshes, it's all moved to Jen now. I think it was Jeffrey Palmer who used to do animated magic cards, did a couple mm-hmm. of the intros, but now basically the podcast intros and all the stream intros and obviously the PPR ones, that's all, that's all mangled pixel. Um, and also, I mean, most notably recently, the Lord of the Rings one, which everyone was like, I want that on a play mat. And then we made the play mat and it was like one of the most popular play mats we've done in a while. Cause it's ideal for signatures. Yeah. <laughs> and of course doing tons, tons of stuff for desert bus as well. We've talked about like, you know, and you know, our families, right which is true, but also in a couple specific instances, members of our families have also been like directly involved in stuff. Like Alex's brother, Ray, Mm -hmm. worked here for a while, was appeared in some episodes of ENN, was the editor on Loading Time for a long time. Oh no, I've been overthrown by an elite black ops group. If only there were someone who could match their skills and expertise. Your brother, Dan, yeah, was you and Dan did a podcast. Then did a podcast. Dan did his own podcast. We'll talk about podcasts in a later Which, episode. This is the future. And humanity is all but extinct. First they start skipping prescribed drug dosages. Then they begin touching. I volunteer as tribute. Uh, Bradley did the, um, the intro to uh, Fight the Future. Yeah. My sister, Kate, was, again, around for years, was in videos, was doing also editing on loading time for quite a while, uh, and, you know, now does her own streaming and stuff. Yes, and we need baby Lisa Sweet. to go up to his door and get him to come outside. Can I tell him to smash his ice pipe? I highly doubt he has one. Yeah, but can I tell him anyways? If you must. was big into the GTA role-playing community, which I did more power to her. I don't get it. Uh, <laughs> um, Kids these days. Yeah, rumble, rumble. rumble. <laughs> you know, I think various members of our families have also just been in sketches as well over the years because it's like, hey, we just need you to, to be in this. And stuff. We need, but it's like... I mean, back in the day, it was like, yeah, we need somebody to play an adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it's it's uh, abundantly clear that we are capable of playing adults ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Sigh. Now we need to start casting children right. when we need a child. We can't just have someone on their knees in like a beanie hat and be like, yes, I am yeah, yeah. 12. Hey, kids. You want some candy? Yeah. yeah. Me too. That's why I'm going to go buy some with my credit card because I'm an adult. Twenty-year-olds playing kids is pretty pretty shaky as it was. Forty-year-olds playing kids doesn't land. Doesn't, doesn't land. No. Yeah. I guess the last thing that I want to say in just sort of broad strokes, it uh, because you know we've mentioned we literally can't talk about anybody, but is that there are so many people who also you don't see in videos and will never have seen in videos and probably don't even probably won't even show up on that people page on the wiki because for example 
the wiki editors aren't going to put themselves on the people page in the wiki. People like the wiki editors. People like the right. people, mods. Not necessarily people. in videos. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, I, I mean, I set up the video strike team for Desert Bus, but they do a lot of stuff for Looking Ready Run too. They, you know, the, 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 the sort of the people who, who like, archive things and know our stuff better than we do and who keep the discord and the twitch chat and stuff uh, you know wonderful places to be this is everyone has contributed to this and mm. it's so it's amazing you know it's like yeah sure this is the thing that we started but we didn't get here on our own so yeah to see that sort of community you know especially especially with the the mods of the you know the discord and the the twitch chat and all those different things that that sort of community growing up um, sort of growing up with us mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, being such a, a positive place that people can hang out, um, is, uh, very, uh, uh, yeah, very gratifying. Yeah. Thank you to all those people as well. And thanks for joining us for this extended episode, uh, where we wanted to just make sure that we got to Shout out as many people yeah. as we could, because there's so many people that have helped us over the years that we can't sit down and talk to them all over the course of this. But and of course, viewers like you <gasps> is you. Well, and listeners, yeah. And and a reminder that you can support us on Patreon at Patreon.com/slash/LoadingReadyRun. <laughs> <laughs> if that's how we sign off, right? It's, it's please continue the support. But honestly, just thank you for watching and being here, and uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. So. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next episode to talk about the next two years in the history of Loading Ready Run. And we'll have two new guests. So tune in for that. Thanks, everybody. Bye.